Welcome everyone to day one of APDA's Upper Midwest Virtual Parkinson Symposium, hosted by the Wisconsin, Iowa, and Minnesota chapters. My name is Dr. Rebecca Gilbert, and I am the Chief Scientific Officer at APDA. We are very excited to have you join us for our two-day educational conference. We have a great lineup for you, and we are sure that you will learn a lot of new information about Parkinson's disease. Today, we will hear from Dr. Christine Domingo on treatment of motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Dr. Domingo is a movement disorders physician and assistant professor at University of Minnesota. Next, we will participate in an empowerment dance led by Lisa Pritzi. After that, Susan Voles, who is a Parkinson's specialty nurse at M Health Fairview in Minneapolis, will speak to us about cognitive changes in PD. Following a short break, we will then hear from Paige Green, who is a registered dietitian at Hy-Vee, who will talk to us about eating well with Parkinson's disease. American Parkinson's Disease Association, or APDA, is the largest grassroots network dedicated to fighting Parkinson's disease and works tirelessly to assist the more than 1 million people with Parkinson's disease in the United States live life to the fullest please visit our website at apdaparkinson.org to explore all that we have to offer. Our website hosts a vast array of publications, webinars, articles, and information that can help you understand your Parkinson's disease. You can also contact APDA through our toll-free helpline 1-800-223-2732, as well as via our social media outlets. Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We also offer programs and services delivered by our network of chapters and information on referral centers located throughout the United States. And that of course includes Iowa, Minnesota, and Wisconsin. The upper Midwest region has a higher incidence of PD than some other areas of the country. And that makes APDA's close to home resources even more crucial for you. The COVID-19 pandemic has affected so much of our lives and is the reason why this conference is being presented to you virtually. Although we sincerely hope that we are able to get together in large groups again very soon in person, there are silver linings to being able to attend an educational conference virtually. No travel was necessary for any of you to be here. You can view this content from the comfort of your own home. You can revisit the material which will, will be posted on our website and you can easily share it with others. People from all over the region and all over the country can join us today. Speakers as well can be accessed much more easily in this virtual reality. And so APDA is embracing this new way of delivering information to you. The COVID-19 pandemic has raised so many questions for our PD community and APDA has tried very hard to provide the answers. Our website hosts much information on COVID-19 and how it relates to PD. We have Q and A's from our readers about COVID-19 and PD. We have a review of the up-to-date medical literature concerning COVID-19 and PD. We have articles that explore ways of staying connected, of maintaining fitness, and of maintaining mental health during this crisis. We also have interviews with experts related to PD care and PD research during the COVID-19 crisis. These interviews explore deep brain stimulation, telemedicine, advanced PD, and medication management during the pandemic. I also wanna highlight a few other APDA resources. APDA has partnered with Smart Patient, an online PD patient community which allows participants to share information and tips with each other. APDA has a symptom tracker app that can be downloaded for free from Apple Store or Google Play. And this app allows people with PD or their care partners to record and track various PD symptoms over time. And this is extremely useful information for you to understand your symptoms and then to share them with your doctor. APDA has a new virtual calendar that I would love for you to check out. Our network of chapters and information on referral centers are designing excellent online programs, and all these programs are avail available to anyone, anywhere. 
all the available events are entered into our calendar and you can register for any of them. These programs include exercise classes of all types, dance for PD, meditation, singing, educational programs like this one, and support groups. So check out our calendar at apdaparkinson.org slash upcoming dash events. During this symposium, you will notice polling questions appear for you to answer. APDA would be very grateful if you would answer them. Your answers will help APDA understand what is important to you and then will help us design future events and programs to help you. Now, without any further ado, I would like to introduce day one of our virtual Parkinson Symposium. Thank you so much for joining us. Acadia Pharmaceuticals is the proud sponsor of this event and a committed partner to the Parkinson's community. While we would prefer to engage with you face-to-face -face as we have in the past, we know that these times call for social distancing and we are hopeful you find this virtual program interesting and helpful. You may be aware of the physical symptoms related to Parkinson's disease, like resting tremors, slow movement, rigid muscles, and loss of balance. But did you know that around half of people living with Parkinson's may also experience hallucinations, such as seeing or hearing things that others don't, and or delusions, such as believing things that aren't true over the course of their disease? If you are living with hallucinations and delusions related to Parkinson's, or caring for someone experiencing these symptoms, it's important to talk to a Parkinson's specialist. They rely on hearing from you or your caregiver. These non-motor symptoms may come with additional challenges and a Parkinson's specialist can help you learn how to navigate them. More information is available at moretoparkinsons.com. Thank you for your participation in today's event, and we look forward to engaging with you at a future Parkinson's community event. Acadia Pharmaceuticals is the proud sponsor of this event. and a You know, this is a live event, so my mic was muted, so I apologize for that. So let me start over. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the first ever Upper Midwest Parkinson Symposium. My name's Natasha Winterbottom, and I'm with the Iowa chapter of the APDA. I am coming to you live from my home in Ankeny, Iowa. We're living through some interesting times, so we would like to know where you're joining us from today. You can go ahead and answer right in your poll on your screen right now. And you'll see the answers pop up right there. Wow, we have some people joining us from all over Minnesota. I see New York City, Minnesota, um, Iowa, gosh, California. We have people from all over today. That's awesome. Okay, well, welcome everyone. We're so glad that you can be here with us today. In fact, before we get started today, I wanted to go over um, a couple things and I wanted to invite you to keep participating throughout um, the program. We're gonna have these polls going on all day. Um, some of them are gonna be fun um, and some of them are gonna just help us here at APD understand you a little bit better and how we can continue to keep serving you. Um, why we're thankful that this virtual program enables us to reach you in the comfort and safety of your own homes. We also wanna ensure that we can keep connected with you. So this is why this was a huge push to do a virtual program and the three chapters come together um, to bring you some of the best speakers across the United States. So today, Going back to those polls, as we're going through today, we're going to be using a program called Slido to connect our questions and answers after each speaker today. Um, so those will be live polls. So as you enter your question, we will see those pop up. So I wanna try another one. How did you hear about us today? How did you hear about this event? Oh, wow, okay. So, so far it was email, okay. 
email website. It looks like everybody's getting the hang of this Slido. I haven't even, even explained how to use it yet. So great job, everyone. Okay, let's see, email, website, word of mouth. You see how that works? It just kind of pops up and shows us your answers. So this is gonna be pretty fun. Okay, before we um, begin today, I wanna just take a moment to thank our very generous sponsors um, who without the, their support today, this wouldn't be, we wouldn't be able to put on something like this. So our presenting sponsor today is Acadia Pharmaceuticals. Thank you so much, Acadia. We appreciate your presenting sponsorship. Our gold sponsors today are AbbVie, Boston Scientific, Kiowa Curran, and, um, and Neurocrin. Our silver sponsors are Accorda Therapeutics, Amnil, Lenbeck, and Medtronic. You can find more information about our sponsors by clicking their logos. Um, below um, their logo or clicking their logo on our broadcast and it'll take you right to their website. Okay, so anyways, thanks again for joining us today. It is a two day symposium. So do not forget to sign back in tomorrow. Um, like I said, we have some amazing speakers coming up. So first I wanna introduce you to Dr. Domingo. Hello, my name is Christine Domingo. I will be presenting today's um, topic on treatment of motor symptoms uh, of Parkinson's disease. I am a movement disorder specialist at the University of Minnesota. Advancing Parkinson's disease motor signs and symptoms that includes increased motor severity, motor fluctuations such as wearing off and dyskinesias, and I'll talk more about this in, in uh, upcoming slides unpredictable responses to medications, nighttime off periods, early morning akinesia or difficulty um, moving because of the rigidity, uh, freezing of gait, postural reflex impairments or basically a difficult time keeping their balance or standing straight, increased falls, uh, and then dysphagia or difficulty swallowing. So it's always important to ask uh, uh, a patient with Parkinson's disease about their typical day. And so here's a, a little diagram here on the right of what a quote unquote typical day would be like um, of a par person with Parkinson's disease, disease as they take their medication. And so uh, in, early in the morning, uh, they'll take their medication and you know throughout the night, if they haven't been taking any medication at all, or their levodopa levels will be a little low. So they'll start to feel those symptoms or potentially in um, uh, early morning akinesia at that time. So they'll take their first dose and then the levodopa levels um, in their plasma will increase and they'll, they'll start to notice a benefit in their symptoms. And then as time uh, continues, the, the medication is metabolized in their system and then they start to notice worsening symptoms and then this wearing off period here where um, uh, they have an off time and then they continue to take their medication and the, the pattern continues. And so it's really important to, to be able to uh, uh, ask your patient, you know, reasons for why or, or when they would have these off times. Um, so it's important to keep track of your symptoms um, throughout the day as well as the night, along with uh, timing of when you take your medications and then also um, when you take your meals, because sometimes your meals, especially protein, can affect the efficacy of um, the absorption of, of medication. And I'll talk more about that in uh, later slides. 
So I just wanted to talk about uh, levodopa related motor fluctuations in Parkinson's disease. And so I've, I've spoken now a few times about wearing off. And so wearing off is basically when uh, a patient with Parkinson's disease will take their medication. So here it's levodopa and they don't notice the medication start to kick in or take effect until much later on, um, a lot later than, than what they expect or when they expect the medication to, to um, start working. And then after a period of time, that's when they start to notice improvement in their symptoms. And then uh, we have a delayed on. And so that is when someone takes their medication and they don't really notice any effect for some period of time. Um, oh, excuse me, with the wearing off, they'll take the medication. There's a delayed, a little bit of a delay. Um, and then the medication wears off sooner than what they expect. So that's what wearing off means. So you would expect potentially that the medication lasts this long. Uh, in, in a period of time, but rather than lasting that period, it, it's uh, shortened. And then with delayed on, they take their medication. Uh, there's a period of time where they don't notice any improvement at all in their symptoms. And then after um, a longer period than they would expect, that's when they start to notice benefit from the medication. And then you have uh, dose failures and so, uh, or a failed dose. And that's when a person will take their medication and they don't notice any benefit at all, even after taking that second dose. And after that second dose uh, or the next dose, they'll start to notice benefit in their symptoms. And so for, uh, uh, for a delayed on as well as dose failures, you really have to think about or consider a protein competition. And so, you know, levodopa uh, competes for the same re receptors as uh, protein. And so if somebody takes their medication, the carbidopa, levodopa, and they take a high protein meal along with it, what happens is, is the medication is not absorbed uh, because it's, it's, it's competing with the protein and, and what's absorbed is the protein and uh, not the medication, not the levodopa. And so that can account for some of this delayed on or even a dose failure. So that's why it's really important to keep in mind, uh, you know, what times you take your medication and then also your meals and what your symptoms are. And then you have this last um, uh, motor, type of motor fluctuation called random on and off. And so that, it's exactly what that means um, is that someone will take their medication, you know, they'll notice an effect. Um, and then despite taking their medications consistently throughout the day, um, you can't, there's no real predictable measurement of how long the medication will last, when it starts, um, and then when the wearing off begins. And so that's when it becomes a random on and off. So it could be just, you know, uh, inconsistent, a dose effect or delayed on, um, that kind of pattern, which is unpredictable. So with advancing Parkinson's disease, motor signs and symptoms, um, I wanted to talk about dyskinesias. And there are three main types. There's peak dose, there's diphasic, as well as dystonia. So I wanna draw your attention here to the diagram on the right. And so in the blue, that is when the patient is on or has a good response to, to their medication, to the levodopa or whatever medication they're taking here, they're saying levodopa. And so when the plasma levels of levodopa um, uh, uh, increase and reach a certain uh, amount, a, a high dose in this in the system, what starts to happen is potential for dyskinesias, and that's what's in the yellow shade here. And then uh, when the medication wears off and uh, levels of plasma levodopa is low, that's when you are in the off state or when you have most um, symptoms of Parkinson's disease. And so we really want to be in this kind of blue zone here, which sometimes can be very difficult. And so in talking about dyskinesias, you have peak dose dyskinesias, which is the most common type of dyskinesia. And um, it correlates with the levodopa plasma levels, and it affects the upper limbs, the head, the trunk, potentially, and it can look choreic, choreic uh, in uh, description. So that kind of means like a dance-like movement affecting the, the, those particular body parts. And so peak dose means they'll take their medication and as the levodopa increases in their system, 
um, at the very peak or the max dose of, of the uh, levodopa concentration in their plasma, that's when they start to notice the dyskinesias. And then you have diphasic dyskinesias, and that is when uh, dyskinesias occur at onset. So we'll they'll take their medication and then they'll have their dyskinesia at onset of the medication and then also at the end of the dose. And that occurs more so in the lower limbs, but it can occur in other areas as well. And then you have dystonia. So dystonia is basically a fixed posturing or potentially um, curling of the toes or it feels like a muscle spasm. Oftentimes it may affect uh, the lower legs, but again, can affect other body parts as well. And so oftentimes dystonias occur as off period dystonias or more so in the, the red zone when the plasma levels of uh, levodopa is low. And dystonias can be painful. So in terms of management of Parkinson's disease, uh, you know, it's, it helps to, to be a part of a team. Um, so I'll, my talk today is main, will mainly be on medication management and therapies. But of course, um, it's always helpful to get physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech therapy involved uh, early on um, or even throughout the disease course. And we often talk about and recommend the Big and Loud program, which is an excellent program for patients with Parkinson's disease, helping with their movements as well as their uh, speech and communication. And then, as I said before, exercise is something that we always, always recommend and promote uh, in whatever safe fashion that they can um, uh, execute it. So recumbent bike, Tai Chi, uh, yoga, boxing, et cetera. And then of course, it's really important to have social support um, you know, around you, either with family or other healthcare providers or social work, nursing staff, whatnot, uh, therapists. And then also there are uh, treatments that are surgical options for, for management of Parkinson's disease, including deep brain stimulation and DUOPA, which I will be talking about in, in later slides. So here are um, the medication options for symptomatic treatment of Parkinson's disease. And as you can see, we've got quite a number of agents that we could use in our armamentarium, which is a, a, a great uh, uh, you know, benefit when treating someone with Parkinson's disease. And I'll be talking about each um, medication class. So this is a review done by the International Parkinson and Movement Disorder Society. It's an evidence-based medicine review on uh, treatments for motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. And so based on the review, uh, they, uh, rec or they found that there was no effective neuroprotective agent uh, available, uh, you know, looking at the, my previous slide or regarding all those medications, and so none of them have a neuroprotective effect. In terms of monotherapy, uh, these medications are efficacious, including levodopa, dopamine agonists, and amantadine. And I'll talk about this a little bit more with amantadine that mostly helps to treat tremor and it has a, um, a modest or uh, a modest benefit in, in treatment of that. Uh, if, you're, if you use it early on in, in someone's uh, disease course. For motor fluctuations, these medications are considered efficacious, including dopamine agonists, levodopa gel intestinal infusions, or otherwise known as duopa, COMT inhibitors, uh, MAOB inhibitors, zinisamide, and deep brain stimulation therapy to the bilateral STN and GPI. For dyskinesias, it's uh, considered efficacious to treat with duopa, amantadine, and then also DBS to bilateral STN and GPI, as well as clozapine. So let's delve into medications now. So this will be the bulk of my, of my uh, talk today. So carbidopa, levodopa, the other name for it is Cinemet, is, is the gold standard treatment for motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease and, has, and it has been for the past 50 years. Uh, this is 
as mentioned in the other slide, this is efficacious in terms of monotherapy for, for patients with Parkinson's disease symptoms. And there's no evidence of enhanced disease progression with this medication, either starting it or being on it. It's most effective overall to treat motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease, and that includes rigidity, the tremor, bradykinesia, as well as gait disturbance. I say plus or minus because this has variable effect on patients for, for improving their gait. And it's really important to be able to discuss with your patients realistic expectations when starting any type of therapy. So Cinemet does not treat things like postural instability, or is not intended to treat things like postural instability, hypophonia, or that soft volume of their voice, sexual dysfunction, excessive sweating, constipation, or dementia. Non-motor side effects include nausea, um, orthostasis, sleepiness, hallucinations. Um, but in terms of these particular side effects, uh, carbidopa levodopa is, is is, um, has less of those types of side effects can, as compared to other uh, PD medications. Motor side effects include dyskinesia, wearing off, and the on and off phenomenon. And um, with Cinemet, um, for a patient with Parkinson's disease, by mid to late disease, most often uh, a patient will be on this medication. And so, a diagram, the diagram on the right shows the different doses of carbidopa levodopa, 25,100 is the most common um, dose that we, a patient would be started on. And Cinemet is composed of two medications, carbidopa as well as levodopa. And so carbidopa, carbidopa acts as kind of a bodyguard to levodopa um, so that the levodopa is not, um, uh, broken down in the periphery and um, acts to uh, be carried through the blood-brain barrier into the central nervous system where it can act to treat the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Without carbidopa, levodopa would be uh, broken down in the periphery and cause symptoms like vomiting. And actually Latin for cinemet, sin is without and emet is emesis. So uh, carbidopa, prevents the degradation of levodopa in the periphery, which then prevents vomiting. So without vomiting, sin and met. So this is the medication that is best taken one hour before a protein rich meal or two hours afterward, because as, as I had said before, levodopa is absorbed via amino acid transport system and therefore competes with dietary protein for absorption into the bloodstream. And so if you take, if you eat a high protein rich meal and take the medication along with it, your body will absorb the protein and not so much the carbidopa levodopa. And so you will not have its maximum effect, unfortunately. So take the medication one hour before a protein rich meal or two hours afterward. So here are the different formulations of carbidopa levodopa. You have IR, which is the shortest duration of action. Typically onset is between 30 to 60 minutes. Uh, oral disintegrating tablet or parcopa is similar in duration to the IR levodopa and does not require water. It actually dissolves on the tongue, but that does not ensure a faster absorption. CR controlled release or extended release is a slightly longer duration of action of levodopa, but it's slower as well as an erratic type of absorption. So most often we use it for uh, bedtime dosing. And so the, the comparison between 200 milligrams of CR levodopa is about 150 milligrams of IR levodopa because of that slower and erratic absorption. You have Saliva, which is a combination of carbidopa, levodopa, as well as anticapone. And then extended release right hairy, which is the longest duration of action in terms of the, of the levodopa formulation. And then Duopa, which is the levodopa intestinal gel administration, which is administered through an external pump. And um, it offers two hours or more of on time. And then you have Enbresia, which is the inhaled rescue form of levodopa intended to treat off episodes. And I'll talk more about these medications. So here we'll talk about Riteri. And here are the different doses of Riteri. You can see it goes from 95 all the way up to 245. 
Riteri combines immediate release levodopa as well as extended release or controlled release levodopa. And the capsule, these capsules contain uh, beads of both the IR and ER formulations. And it's a rapid onset of action with the IR with an extended effect from the controlled release uh, beads. And so it doubles the duration of effect of regular levodopa. So it may increase on time by about one hour or more. Typically it's dosed between three to four times in the day and it should be swallowed whole as a capsule or you can actually open up the, cancel, the, the capsule and sprinkle it on a patient's food such as applesauce. So this is a medication that is intended to treat motor fluctuations. Uh, and particularly the wearing off effect of motor fluctuation and is not indicated for initial treatment. So let's talk about the advantages of dis disadvantages of Riteri. So advantages, you have fewer doses during the day. So you can imagine if someone's taking it every three hours and they can extend it by an extra hour, you know, that can provide um, benefit for someone's quality of life. Uh, or even uh, more than an hour. And uh, so the change in levodopa doses of Riteri are smaller increments. And so that potentially could mean that you have more control of your motor symptoms because you're increasing by smaller amounts and then potentially could, could avoid a side effect like dyskinesias. If someone's taking nighttime dosing of, leave, of Riteri, you, have, you potentially could have less symptoms during the night and then improved sleep as a result of uh, improved Parkinson's disease symptoms. So the disadvantages of Riteri is that you, you, you know, you're potentially having to take more pills in a single dose, even though it's less throughout the day or less intervals throughout the day. And then sometimes switching from IR levodopa to Riteri can be a little bit uh, cumbersome. The conversion in switching uh, from IR to Riteri isn't an exact science and requires trial and error. And so patience from the patient uh, in, in order to find that right dose, because sometimes you could calculate it to be a little bit too much and they could be dyskinetic and be uncomfortable, or they could be, could be too low and they could be uh, feeling stiff. And it takes time to adjust. So it really helps to work with a pharmacist uh, to be able to find that right adjustment uh, because you'll likely talk with the patient uh, for more uh, more times during this, this transition period. Also, brand names uh, may be more expensive. And then uh, this, again, as I said, this is not made for initial treatment of Parkinson's disease, more so to treat motor fluctuations, uh, uh, particularly the wearing off effect. So let's talk about dopamine agonists. So mechanism of dopamine agonist is that it mimics dopamine in the brain. Uh, it can be used as a monotherapy early on in the disease and it's approved for early and advanced Parkinson's disease symptoms. You can add a dopamine agonist to, to leave a dopa to, to reduce off time. And it helps to improve motor scores of Parkinson's disease, delay dyskinesias, and it's less potent uh, than, than leave a dopa in terms of treating the motor symptoms. Side effects include nausea, dizziness, orthostatic hypotension, uh, pedal edema or swelling, drowsiness with sudden sleep attacks, and impulse control disorders, uh, meaning a change in behavior where potentially you could be watching more pornography, um, behaving more sexual acts, uh, over shopping, gambling, or overeating. So these are always things to ask the patient about or ask their family members about if there's been a change in uh, behavior at all when uh, after starting a dopamine agonist. So things to consider is that uh, dopamine agonists are more prone than levodopa to cause symptoms like hallucinations as, and confusion. So you really have to, uh, you know, uh, think hard if you want to start this medication in an older patient and potentially even avoid it for people who are older and especially for those who are demented. Here are the different medications of dop dopamine agonists, primipexil, ropinrol, and rotigotine. And you can see the different doses that, you, that one can take in milligrams per day and the different doses available. 
uh, in each of these medications. And you can see that primapexil and rapinerol come in IR or immediate release and extended release formularies. Um, and that rotigotine is a 24 hour patch that is worn on the skin and that's how they receive their medication. And you can also see the half-life uh, of dopamine agonists are longer than levodopa. So early on with, with studies, we had seen that the onset of dyskinesia was less with dopamine agonists, and then also the half-life was longer. So uh, when comparing you know, when, whether to start a dopamine agonist versus levodopa, because of those factors, you know, people tended to lean more towards dopamine agonists, but I'll talk more about that in a little bit. Oh, also the half-life of rotigotine um, is about five hours and that's after the patient removes the patch from, from their skin. So as the patch is on, the medication is being provided to them through their skin. And then when they take it off, they have a half-life of about five hours after removing it. So here is a depiction of the uh, uh, rotigotine or nupro patches. Here's the different doses of the patch. Uh, and then also, where you can apply the patch on different areas of the skin. And so they always recommend to change the location of where you place the patch in order to avoid irritation in the, in the skin um, in that area. And that's something that you wear for 24 hours. So side effects, I just wanted to compare levodopa with dopamine agonists. So levodopa is uh, more so associated then dopamine agonists to cause nausea, dyskinesia, motor fluctuations, and a condition called dopamine dysregulation syndrome. And so this is akin to being addicted to dopamine. So despite having uh, relatively controlled symptoms and maybe even dyskinesias from having too much dopamine in their system, um, they're finding that they're wanting to take more dopamine and more dopamine um, to uh, better improve or even avoid their motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. So they really truly become uh, addicted to taking medication, which then, of course, if you take too much of carbidopa, levodopa, you have, uh, you could potentially lead to side effects. And then dopamine agonists, more so than levodopa, uh, can lead to impulse control disorder, drowsiness with sudden sleep attacks, hallucinations, orthostatic hypotension, and fetal edema with erythema. So when considering whether to start dopamine agonists versus levodopa for initial therapy, uh, there's a couple of things to keep in mind. Dop dopamine agonists have less risk for dyskinesias and motor fluctuation within the first five years of, uh, of disease course in Parkinson's disease, but it's also associated with more side effects as I had mentioned in the previous slide. With levodopa, you have better efficacy for treating the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. You also have fewer side effects, and there is no evidence of neurotoxicity. However, keeping all of this in mind, you know, we have to always, uh, you know, with treating Parkinson's disease, there is no right or wrong answer. Um, there is no one size fits all in terms of, of uh, what's the best medication to treat everyone with Parkinson's disease. It's a, it's, a, it's a therapy that's individualized and something that you discuss together to communicate, it's a type of, you have to communicate with, with uh, the patient as well as the physician and consider what's the predominant symptom that you're wanting to treat, disease severity, side effect profile of the medication you're considering as well as cost to the patient. So there are several medications that uh, prolong the effect of levodopa, including COMT inhibitors and MAOB inhibitors. And so these two classes of medication provide about one to two hours of increase on time with effective treatment when combined with levodopa. So this must be given or taken with levodopa because on its own, COMT inhibitors and MAOB inhibitors do not have independent action on their own. So these are the examples of COMT inhibitors. And COMT stands for catechol-O-methyltransferase. And COMT metabolizes levodopa primarily in the GI tract. And that um, the peripheral COMT blockade improves CNS levodopa levels, which helps treat uh, motor symptoms. It helps to extend the clinical benefit of levodopa by reducing off time and increasing on time. These are the different types of COMT inhibitors, anticapone, uh, peripherally blocks the enzyme COMT, and these are the side effects as associated with 
a unique side effect of enticapone is the orange discoloration of urine, tears, and sweat. So just keep that in mind and tell your patients about it before they discover it on their own. These are the typical doses of this medication. Again, and again, it, enticapone or COMPT inhibitors must be taken with levodopa in order for it to um, uh, provide its, its therapeutic benefit. And again, there's Stilevo, which is an option of levodopa, carbidopa, and enticapone all in one medication. Opicapone is the new kid on the block in terms of COMPT inhibitors and was FDA approved in 2020. And so again, it's got that peripheral blockade of COMPT. These are its side effects, including constipation and dyskinesia. And it's a once daily dosing, which is a really nice um, option for this medication. And so um, uh, and then you have tolcopone, which has central and peripheral blockade of COMPT enzyme. And it's rarely used nowadays because of the risk of hepatic failure. Now we have MAOB inhibitors. And so MAOB is an enzyme in the brain that breaks down dopamine. It effectively, or it, it works to improve motor features of Parkinson's disease and can be used as a monotherapy or as an adjunct to other medications for Parkinson's disease, including levodopa. So it, this medication helps to decrease off time. So these are the side effects associated with this medication. And the caveat is that MAOB inhibitors have many drug interactions, such as to antidepressants, um, uh, a couple of medications for anxiety and dextromethorphan are examples. In combination of, of low doses of SSRIs, that's been shown to be safe when using um, MAOB inhibitors. But you really have to monitor them for uh, potential for serotonin syndrome. These are the different medications of MAOB inhibitors. You have selegiline, which is taken twice a day. Uh, keep in mind that you wanna make sure that second dose is taken early on in the afternoon to prevent sleep issues or insomnia. This is a medication that's metabolized into eye amphetamine. So you wanna warn patients who potentially are tested for amphetamine because they could test positive. And then this helps to reduce off time by about, by about one to one and a half hours. Then you have Versagiline, which is taken once daily. And this is not metabolized into an amphetamine and it reduces off time by about 1.2 hours. You have Cefinamide, which is also taken once daily. And uh, based on the studies for this medication, after 24 weeks, it helped to increase uh, on time by about 0.8 hours. And these are the effects, including modest increase in dyskinesia, excuse me. Amantadine is an NMDA antagonist that increases dopamine release and blocks dopamine reuptake, uh, therefore increasing the concentration or the amount of dopamine in the system. It helps to treat patients early on for uh, a, a tremor, which again, as I've said, has a modest benefit when treating this particular symptom. Most often, uh, this medication is chosen to, use, uh, to be used in mid to late disease uh, for Parkinson's disease, for bothersome levodopa-induced dyskinesia. And these are the, this is the dose for which we uh, may start or use amantadine. And here are the side effects. So we really have to pay attention to, to the anticholinergic side effect, uh, which means uh, dry eyes, dry mouth, uh, urinary retention, constipation. It can be associated with leg swelling, hallucinations, uh, likely from the anticholinergic effect, insomnia, lightheadedness, nausea, as well as levito reticularis, which is, which is uh, provided, there's an example here of levito reticularis, which is uh, kind of a blotching of the skin. Now, this is not painful, but as you can tell, it can be unsightly. And when you, if you choose to stop the medication, this, this resolves. So you, we have to take caution when um, we consider this medication for patients who have renal insufficiency or failure because amantadine is secreted unchanged to the kidney. So you really have to consider a dose adjustment for these uh, particular patients. There are different uh, formularies of amantadine. You have Gocovery, which is an extended release 
uh, uh, excuse me, amantadine. And so this is approved for treatment of levodopa-induced dyskinesias. And it also has been shown to reduce off time by about 0.9 hours. And here are the uh, side effects associated with GoCovery. And this is the doses of GoCovery. Osmolex is approved for Parkinson's disease. And then also here are the doses for this medication. Now, anticholinergics um, are another type of treatment for Parkinson's disease. And the idea is that you restore the acetylcholine dopamine balance by treating with uh, anticholinergics. So it's most useful in young patients because as you can tell with the anticholinergic effect, uh, we, want, we would want to avoid those side effects in the elderly. Um, and it's useful for young patients with tremor predominant Parkinson's disease symptoms. It's effective for tremor, as I mentioned, and here are the side effects when using this, this uh, medication class. And again, you wanna avoid it because of these side effects for patients who are older. Isradephaline uh, is um, an adenosine A2 receptor agonist. And so adenosine A2A receptor stimulate, stimulation may lead to abnormality in signals for motor control and Parkinson's disease. And so estradefaline is used as an adjunctive therapy to carbidopa levodopa to decrease off time in Parkinson's disease. So here's the dose. The dose is of estradefaline and it's taken once daily. And it, it approximately decreases off time by about one hour and improves motor symptoms. Side effects include mild to moderate dyskinesia as well as constipation. So now let's talk about on-demand therapies. So uh, the on-demand therapies are mostly considered for patients who have unpredictable off time. So oftentimes this is something that's considered when patients with Parkinson's disease are later on in the disease process. And off times can be related to several different uh, uh, things, inclu including stress, uh, after meals or postprandial, end of dose or shortened benefit from levodopa and delayed onset. It could also be associated with partial response or failed response to their Parkinson's disease medication. So in order for it to be a successful on-demand therapy, it should have a quick onset of action, should be well tolerated by the patient, and have an easy administration. So here is apomorphine or apokin, which is a subcutaneous administration of this medication. It's a type of dopamine agonist. And it's the first kind of rescue medication that was out in the market. And it's treated, or it, it helps to treat sudden off periods. So its response is equal to levodopa. And uh, after it's injected, so it, as you can see here, it's a very fine, about 29 gauge needle, but it's something that you have to inject into uh, your body part to get the medication. Um, but once injected, its onset is a little bit less than 10 minutes and it lasts between an hour to two hours. So it's got a short duration of action, so it should not interfere with the regular dosing of a patient's um, carb or, you know, uh, Parkinson's disease medication. The other medication is, uh, so the, the newer one, this was approved in, in, I believe, 2020, but this is apomorphine, but a sublingual uh, distribution of apomorphine, again, a dopamine agonist. It's got this bilayer film where it has the medication um, and also a P, so here, the bilayer film, here's the medication, and then a, a pH modifier that helps in, um, uh, improve the permeation of this medication. So this is a medication that is uh, administered under the tongue, and after that, that's how it's incorporated into the circulation. And um, it, because of that, it avoids GI delays, as well as that first pass effect. And as you can see here, it's available in different doses um, of strength. So let's talk about adverse effects and special considerations for uh, sublingual apomorphine or Kinmobi. So it's associated with uh, these side effects or pharyngeal irritation, um, which in about 70% in the study uh, led to discontinuation nausea, somnolence, orthostatic hypotension, as well as prolonged QT in one patient. Things to really consider with this medication is that uh, three days prior to, to starting Kinmobi, you are uh, pre-treated with 
an anti-nausea medication called trimethobenzamide, which helps decrease the side effect of the nausea. You wanna be able to drink water before administering this medication in order for it to, to be better absorbed. And as I said, it must, it's applied under the tongue. It must be kept under the tongue in order for it to be dissolved and completely, it has to be completely dissolved in order for it to get into uh, circulation. So oftentimes uh, that takes about three minutes. Um, maximal dose is about five doses per day. And this medication is contraindicated with use of 5-HT3 uh, antagonists like ondansetron or Zofran. Next, we have the inhalational levodopa or embresia. This is approved for intermittent off periods in Parkinson's disease. You can take up to five doses per day and it, it uh, decreases off time by about 0.8 hours in the day. This medication is provided with these capsules which contains the medication and should not be swallowed. And so you take this capsule and you administer it into this embresia inhaler you press down, uh, once this is inserted into the inhaler, you press down on this white part of the inhaler, which punctures the capsule, and then allows for you to be able to, to, the patient to put their mouth over this mouthpiece and then simply inhale the medication. So again, we should not swallow the, the capsules. It's uh, administered via this embresia uh, inhaler. And uh, it was not shown to change and. Uh, uh, Pulmonary, pulmonary function tests. So let's talk about special, uh, or excuse me, surgical therapies for Parkinson's disease, and that includes duopa as well as deep brain stimulation. For duopa, uh, this provides a continuous release of levodopa during the day uh, via this external pump. The medication is provided via this drug cassette. And then you can set the pump to be able to administer the medication at a particular rate that you set. And so the, uh, the pump is connected to this tube, this tube, and the tube is connected to the jejunum. So as you can see, this is a surgical procedure to insert this, this uh, tube. The levodopa um, is directly delivered to the small intestine where the levodopa is best absorbed which allows for a more steady state of levodopa throughout the day. And uh, because of, of that factor, there are no issues with delayed gastric emptying or slow GI transit. So uh, with, with duopa, uh, it's approximately about $60,000 per year. Uh, the company does offer coverage and reimbursement support. Uh, which is a good opportunity for, for all patients to take advantage of if they choose this, this uh, type of therapy. And as you can see, there are, there are a large uh, percentage of, of complications associated with this therapy. So 35% with de device insertion, then they have abdominal pain, nausea, post-operative wound infection, and then also 40% of uh, patients have levodopa-associated peripheral neuropathy after starting this medication. Uh, when evaluating these patients for the peripheral neuropathy, they were found to have increased homocysteine, reduced vitamin B12, increased MMA, and reduced vitamin B6. So this is something to keep in mind for anybody that you potentially consider to start this therapy, and especially who, for those who start the therapy is, you know, it might be a good idea to start uh, a daily vitamin supplementation uh, to hopefully you know, uh, get ahead of this if possible. And then we have deep brain stimulation. And so this is a reversible procedure that involves uh, placement of a medical device called a neurostimulator. And this neurostimulator provides electrical impulses through the wire to electrodes or the, uh, this lead, which, which um, contains electrodes to specific targeted areas of the brain, which help to control symptoms of Parkinson's disease. So sometimes this is referred to a, as a brain pacemaker. Um, and this is a type of treatment considered for Parkinson's disease patients who have motor fluctuations, wearing off, dyskinesia, or medically refractory tremor. Now this is not a cure for Parkinson's disease and it helps primarily to, 
to uh, treat the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. And that includes tremor, bradykinesia, and rigidity. So it's really important to be able to have this conversation about realistic expectations for patients um, because you wanna be able to provide the best type of therapy and um, be on the same page of what goals uh, that the patient wants to treat in terms of their symptoms and what's attainable. So this is a type of therapy that's been approved to treat Parkinson's disease since 1997. So here is a, a video of uh, a patient with DBS and it's a demonstration of their symptoms uh, being treated with deep brain stimulation. So here, DBS therapy is off, and here, DBS is on. Now she's turning the therapy back on. Again, therapy off and versus therapy on. And you can see that the DBS really helps to treat his tremor and the slowness. And that's actually quite profound. And so I just wanted to uh, talk about University of Minnesota. We have a, an amazing DBS program um, that utilizes neurologists who are movement disorder specialists, neurosurgeons, uh, neuropsychologists, psychiatrists, a wonderful nursing staff and, and researchers uh, to help uh, patients who are interested in DBS, uh, who are under you know, placement at DBS and also DBS therapy. And then uh, we're actively um, involved in research regarding this as well. So here are some upcoming therapies to keep in mind or just kind of potentially keep your eye out for. This is Neuroderm or ND0612. This is a continuous subcutaneous infusion of carbidopa levodopa and it allows for stable plasma levodopa levels similar to Riteri, or excuse me, similar to uh, Duopa. And it helps to reduce off times without troublesome dyskinesias, um, as seen in um, uh, studies done on it currently. And uh, its limitation is that it, it, it's only able to provide up to 900 milligrams per day of levodopa. Another upcoming therapy is the accordion pill, or AP09904. This is a gastric retention capsule. So this is a medication that's swallowed. And once it's swallowed, it opens up uh, as an accordion, as the, as the name suggests, and it has multiple layers combining IR and ER formulations of levodopa. Its plasma half-life is about five to seven hours, and it's given about three times a day. And it's currently in phase three studies comparing this medication, the accordion pill, to IR levodopa. Here are some resources for Parkinson's disease patients. Um, if you're interested, this is, this is a part of the support group um, that surrounds patients with Parkinson's disease um, that have been very beneficial. And now I'll talk um, or I'll take questions and start our discussion. I, I first want to say before we end this, thank you so much to APDA for allowing me to talk um, or present this, this lecture. And also thank you to the University of Minnesota, um, my mentors, uh, colleagues, and friends. Um, it, it, it's been, uh, I just wanted to say thank you. All right, I'll start the questions now. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Christine. I thought it was really, really helpful to have that extremely comprehensive review of the many, many treatment options for the motor symptoms of Parkinson's. So thanks so much for taking the time to share your expertise with us. And Absolutely. we wonderful. And we have several questions from our audience. Um, one of our audience members said he was just diagnosed with Parkinson's and his doctor suggested that he take the medication at nighttime versus morning. Is there any difference in effectiveness and time frames? Sure, that's a great question. So, um, uh, of course, like I had said in my in my PowerPoint, there's no one one size fits all in terms of treating Parkinson's disease. So you really have to have this discussion with your physician as well as the patient. There have been some studies that show early on in Parkinson's disease that if you treat via nighttime dose, that medication allows for buildup. Um, and then treatment uh, that lasts, uh, that's a prolonged treatment as opposed to just the, the um, half-life of about three to four hours. Um, and so those studies have shown that if early on in the disease process, if you take the medication at night, it can help to improve symptoms because of that longer uh, effect that they've seen in, in these particular studies. And of course, the caveat to that is if the, in the, med if the um, disease process starts to progress, um, and this might not be the best option, but of course, that's why you work closely with your physician and you have an, an active conversation with them regarding what your symptoms are and um, what uh, what you want to be able to treat and what medication to take and how you want to take it. Great. Thank you. That was really informative. And another common question that I see coming through is, is there any benefit to taking a break from carbidopa levodopa dosing for a period of time? That's also a great question. Um, so I'm going to reach back here, a, a little history lesson. Um, uh, back before, um, uh, early on in, in Parkinson's disease in terms of the history, I shouldn't say far back, it's not too far back, but I want to say in the, in the 70s and 80s, they used to use that strategy and take uh, levodopa breaks. Um, and they found that for some patients, um, they started to notice uh, a different type of uh, disease or different type of symptoms called the, it's called neuroleptic malignant syndrome. And so if you're a person with Parkinson's disease that's taking a good dose of, of levodopa and then you completely take a break and stop the medication, you might develop this particular syndrome. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's really something to look out for. And because of that, we don't recommend stopping the medication abruptly. You know, this is a really good point to, to make that it's, uh, and I always have with my patients, when, when someone takes levodopa and then they start to notice that they need, require more and more uh, or increased dose of the medication, I always like to explain that it's not because uh, you're developing a resistance to the medication. Um, it's more so because your disease is likely progressing and you're needing more of the levodopa in your system to be able to treat your symptoms successfully. And so, it, you know, it's, it's not so much that over time you use up the levodopa or the carbidopa levodopa in your system. Um, it's more so likely that your disease is progressing and you need more of it in your system to be able to treat your symptoms. Great. I, that's really interesting. I didn't know about that history regarding the carbidopa levodopa breaks that used to be recommended. So yeah. that was really eye-opening. So another question here, um, someone says, let's see. I think someone said, if I would like to switch to Riteri, is there a generic of that? Unfortunately, not right now. Um, Riteri is a newer type of medication and it's the know, uh, one of a kind right now where it, where it does um, combine the IR and CR uh, formularies of levodopa. And so right now it's, it's, it's only, um, there's no generic form of it. Okay. And I'm curious, I just want to add on to that with my own question. Mm -hmm. Do you know, like, is there usually a time frame when generics become available? Is it like two years or three years? Like, oh, that's a good that... I think the, oh, and, and this is not my field. <laughs> so I, I think um, in terms of when someone comes out with a new medication, they have a patent on it for about 10 years. Okay, great. Thank you for answering that. And someone else asked, 
you know, in your talk, when you were referring to off and on time, Mm -hmm. are you referring to physical symptoms only, like the physical motor symptoms? Oh, that's also a great question. So Parkinson's disease really uh, manifests as uh, physical symptoms as well as non-physical symptoms. And so my talk just basically focused on the motor symptoms or the physical symptoms of Parkinson's disease. But uh, but when people notice um, themselves starting to feel off or when they have off periods, they really start to feel not only the motor symptoms, but potentially non-motor symptoms as well, such as agitation, anxiety, um, you know, a restlessness for some people. So that, that's not to say that everyone experience these, experiences these off um, symptoms, but it can manifest as more than just motor symptoms or physical symptoms. Yeah, and I've just anecdotally heard that as well as to, at different Parkinson's support groups. Mm-hmm. So that's something to be aware of. Mm-hmm. And someone else has asked, how do you know when it's okay to have protein when taking carbidopa, levodopa to avoid what you mentioned about, you know, having a lot of protein in your meal that affects the absorption of the drug. So I always recommend take the medication an hour before a protein rich meal or two hours afterward. Sometimes people can, uh, can um, uh, manage with taking the medication one hour before and one hour afterward. So it's something that you can just kind of observe in yourself and see what is best. But I, as a general rule, I say take the medication one hour before, two hours afterward to have, you know, to be able to experience the maximum benefit of that, of levodopa or carbidopa levodopa. Great. I think that's, you know, I'd almost recommend people just like write it down and tape it on their fridge because that's such a absolutely. helpful piece yes. of advice. Yes, yeah, absolutely. You know, it's something that we always have to remind um, people who may be living in nursing homes who get the medication administered to them. Mm-hmm. Um, because it matters. It matters how how they react to the medication, how, how they respond. Great. And someone else has asked, what is the best treatment for dyskinesia? And, oh. you know, because um, you mentioned that dosing of levodopa could be a cause. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that's a, that's a um, multiple a- answer question, um, similar to what I was saying about how there's no one size fits all. So dyskinesias, as I was, as I had mentioned in my, in my lecture, is that it could be um, peak dose dyskinesia. So it means, you know, you're, you're having, you're experiencing symptoms when the levodopa is uh, the highest concentration in your plasma level. And so a way to, to treat dyskinesias could be to, um, uh, you know, um, uh, look at the dose that you're on right now and see if you can tolerate decreasing the dose. And so that's not something that everyone can tolerate. So if they can't tolerate that particular step, then what we do then is add on a medication such as amantadine, which helps specifically to treat dyskinesias um, or even go covery um, if they can't tolerate amantadine because uh, it's a longer acting amantadine uh, formulation. Uh, there's uh, several other uh, things that we can consider uh, in terms of treating dyskinesias, but like I said, it's it's a active conversation you have with your physician, and there's not just a one uh, one consideration or a one step that you can do to help treat it. There's a couple different things you could do, but those are the two things I would start off with: is see if they can t- decrease the dose, if they can tolerate that, and then potentially add on a, a different medication to help treat that particular Super symptom. Super helpful advice, and this is why we recommend that every person with Parkinson's see a movement disorder specialist like Dr. Domingo, because movement disorder specialists are the people that are just most equipped to answer these complicated questions that come up with medication management related to Parkinson's. And we have another question here. Um, The person wants to know, what can you tell us about drugs that might slow the progression of Parkinson's? And they mentioned a couple of examples like Mm -hmm. exenatide or terazosin. Could you say that first one again? Um, exenatide. Exenatide. E-X-E-N-A-T-I-D-E. So that's something that they mentioned. Exenatide. That one doesn't sound familiar to me. Mm-hmm. Um, but in terms of drugs that slow progression, you know, there is uh, several different studies 
that specifically try to answer that question, can we use medications to slow the progression of Parkinson's disease? And so uh, early on in the disease process, some of these studies show that if you start a dopamine agonist or levodopa earlier on, as opposed to waiting until the symptoms really interfere with daily activities, that could be a hindrance as opposed to a benefit, you know, for people that believe that uh, starting a medication later on is better than starting it sooner to, to save the, the effects of that medication. And so uh, most of the studies have shown that, you know, starting a medication as soon as um, uh, Parkinson's disease symptoms start to interfere with their daily life is likely the, the way to go when you initiate therapy for Parkinson's disease and that holding off likely will not provide any more benefit. Um, now, are there medications that will that will um, slow or um, prevent the progression? As of right now, there aren't any medications that do that. Um, you know, as I always like to tell patients, this is Parkinson's disease is a neurodegenerative process, meaning that we expect it to continue to progress. We expect symptoms to worsen. But that's why you work closely with your physician to be able to monitor symptoms and you know, be able to treat as that progression continues. And so again, it's an active conversation. But to answer that question, uh, sorry, it's long winded, but there are no medications right now that will stop the progression of Parkinson's disease. Okay, great. Thank you so much. So unfortunately, that is all the questions we have time for today. But you know, you know, people were really interested in your talk. We had so many questions coming in. And I just want to encourage everybody, if you're interested in seeing a movement disorders expert like Dr. Domingo, con contact your local APDA Information and Referral Center, and we can help get you connected with a movement disorders specialist so that you can get this level of expertise every time you see your physician to help manage your care. So with that, thank you again, Dr. Domingo, for taking the time to join us. We're so deeply appreciative of your sharing your presentation with us today. Absolutely. Thank you, Anushka, and thank you to APDA. And I just want to mention one more thing. It's important. Oh, OK, so that's that's it. <laughs> thank you very much, everybody. Thank you for your time. Great, have a great rest of your day. You too, thank you. Pleasure and honor 
of spending about the next 10 minutes with all of you doing some movement to music. So we specialize in a program called Dance for PD, and it is a program out of New York. It's been around for about 20 years, and we are trained to provide dance activities to individuals with Parkinson's. So we're going to start in our chairs. A couple of things first. As we find our position in our chair, want to make sure your chair is sturdy. Feet are going to be flat on the floor directly underneath your knees. And during the next two activities, if you need to modify a movement, decrease your range of motion, or just utilize one side of your body, right? We always want to modify to make sure that it feels good to you. So here's what we're going to do for our first activity. It's a bit of a warm up. We're going to reach our hands forward four times, reaching forward, a little bit of a hinge at your waist. Again, making sure that those feet are firm on the floor. You're going to feel a little weight pour into those feet. So we're going to do this four times. And on the fourth time, I want you to bring your hands all the way up over your head. Okay? From here, I want you to take one arm and just like it would be candle wax dripping off of a candle, it's going to melt all the way down to the floor. The other hand is still going to be reaching up towards the ceiling. Let's bring those hands back together. And then we're going to repeat that on the other side, bringing it down and up. Great. Now, from there, we're going to open up your arms nice and wide. And as you do this, feel a beautiful opening through your chest. Important, though, to keep your shoulders relaxed away from your ears, opening up that chest nice and wide. So we're just going to close and open our arms a few times. And then the last little bit, we're going to take a carving motion. One arm, I want you to carve down towards the floor, like you're taking a big scoop of ice cream here. Yes, good. Now I want you to give me some high fives, two of them. High five, high five. Good. Let's repeat that on the other side. A scoop and then a high five. Okay? So those are the ingredients. So let's reposition ourselves. Make sure your feet are flat on the floor. Here we go. We're going to reach forward four times. Here's number one. And one. Again. Two. Three. All the way up with your arms. Reach it down to the side. Bring it back center. Again, reverse it. And reach. One more time. Nice and slow. Each side controlling that movement. Keep it moving. Nice and slow. You got it. Opening up those arms wide. Here we go. Open. And cross them. Now give me two a little faster. Open. And cross. Open one big slow one. Here we go. Inhale. Open that chest to the sky and close two faster. Yes. Here we go. Big scoop to the side, nice and slow. Two high fives. Other side. Here we go. Nice. Two high fives. Again, other side. One more time. Scoop. High five. Here we go. Reach those hands forward four times. And one. Now as we start to feel comfortable in this movement, maybe you reach a little further, a little longer, all the way up to the ceiling. Drop those hands a little faster. And up. And two. Three. Last one. Open those arms nice and slow. Big inhale. And close. Two faster. Open. Close. Like you're waving me down. Yes, I can see you guys all the way out there in virtual land. Again, two faster. Open. Close. Open. Close. Give me a scoop to the side. Bye bye. Other side. Big scoop all the way down to the floor. Again. Here we go. Scoop. High five. Nice. And scoop. High five. From the top. Four reaches. Here we go. One. And two. Like your hands are moving through water. All the way up. Splash that water overhead. Drop it down to the floor. Alternating. Right and left. Again. Eyes follow fingers. You got it. 
Open and close those arms. And slow, close. A little faster. Open, close. Open, close. Keep it going right here. Drop your hands to the ground. Give me a scoop. Do high fives. Other side. Scoop. High five. You got it. Excellent. Excellent job. All right. Next activity is going to be a fun little game of rock, paper, scissors. So it's a little dexterity and a little coordination. So we have a rock. And it's going to be a closed fist. Okay, all right. From there, I want you to show me paper, which is opening up your hand, right? It's going to be a blade, so flat fingers, right? Then from there, we need to throw out a little pair of scissors. You got it. Good. Rock, paper, scissors. Let's try that together. Here we go. We have rock, paper, scissors, and at the end, I want you to give me a little snap, okay? Let's try that with the other hand. Rock, paper, scissors, snap, okay? From there, I want you to hold your hand out for me, and I want you to imagine that it's just stacked with $100 bills, and we are going to share the love, all right? So I want you to just take those hundreds. I want you to flick them around your room. From there, we're going to work a little bit into our lower body. Now we're going to start on getting comfortable. You may want to open up your feet just a little bit wider than your hips and slide those toes forward just a tad. We're going to take your toes. I want you to rotate them in and then bring them out. Okay, try that again. Bring them in and out and in and out. All right, so that work is happening right here from our waist, letting our hips initiate that movement so that our whole leg is opening and closing. And then from there, we're going to keep our toes in position and just lift your heels up and down, okay? So we'll do some variations of that movement, some toes, and then lifting your heels, okay? That's it. You got it. All right. So those are the ingredients for a dance. That's all you're going to need to know. We have our rock, paper, scissors, other hand, rock, paper, scissors, okay? From there. We're going to hand out the dough. Yeah, some for me, some for you, some for all of us. And then from there, our last little bit is going to be toes in and out. We'll do that one, and we'll do our heels a few times, all right? So I will instruct you along the way. Just have fun with it. You guys are moving, and that's all that matters today. Excellent work. Here we go. Let's do this. You guys ready? Give me some clapping. We start to feel the rhythm of that music. Yes, here we go. Get those rock, paper, scissors ready. Here we go. One hand. Rock. Paper. Scissors. Snap. Again. Other hand. Rock. Paper. Scissors. Both hands. All right. Paper. Scissors. Snap. Try that again. Both hands. All right. Close your feet. Four steps. 
Open your feet. A one, two, three, four, five, six. Try the other leg. More steps. Now eight little ones. Close your leg. Good. Step right here. Now eight to open. You got it. Rock, paper, scissors. Here we go. Rock. Paper. Scissors. Other hand. Step. Here we go. Nice. Rock. Paper. Scissors. Step faster. Rock. Paper. Scissors. Step. Rock. Paper. Both hands. Let's go. Rock. Paper. Scissors. Hand up that cash. Awesome. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I hope you enjoy the rest of your symposium. If you would like more information on our classes, we are holding them weekly. You can find that at empowermentdance.com. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Bye. Welcome everyone. My name is Susan Vold. I'm a movement disorder nurse care coordinator and the deep brain stimulation program manager at the University of Minnesota M Health Fairview's neurology clinic. I've been in this role since 2012 and I've witnessed many my patients living with a lot of issues and with their disease for nearly nine years. So I've seen progression in a lot of them. As time has progressed, so has their illness, and that's the nature of a progressive neurodegenerative illness. Many of my patients are also dealing with the stresses of isolation due to the pandemic and the overall emotional climate of the United States right now. And so for some, it's pushing themselves and their families over the edge. Talking about these cognitive changes is key. It's the first step in decreasing fear, misinformation, misperception, and shame. 
it is when we don't talk about these things that our energies are spent walking a thin line with nothing to prevent us from going over that edge. So we need some tools in the toolbox. How do we handle this? I tell all my patients and their care partners that planning for a crisis when they're in the midst of a crisis is not a good idea. So talk about the changes that you are seeing, sensing, feeling. And I don't mean just, just the care partner. I will, I'm asking the person with Parkinson's to talk about any changes. This takes courage to do. Get help to cope along the way. Cognitive changes don't happen suddenly. If they do, we want to look for a different cause other than Parkinson's disease. In order to understand what cognitive changes can occur in Parkinson's disease, we need to understand what cognition is in the first place. So cognition, according to Oxford Dictionary, it encompasses a few things, these things right now. It's the mental action or process of acquiring knowledge and understanding through thought, experience, and the senses. So looking at this slide, you can see it has to do with attention, executive function, memory, language, visual, spatial skills. This is all a part of that one word that we call cognition. So let's talk about the first thing, attention. That is that ability to focus on one thing while tuning out everything else. Now, this is, this changes in Parkinson's disease. If a person has difficulty paying attention, it can be nearly impossible to follow a conversation or a plot in a movie. And this can contribute to feelings of anxiety in social situations, sometimes leading to the avoidance of those situations. A person with Parkinson's is in, in the middle of a conversation at a, a club event and people are asking them a question and they, they just haven't kept up with the conversation and so they're left not knowing what to say. So the question is, can you follow a conversation? Do you avoid social gatherings? Are you no longer interested in reading a book or watching a movie because you just can't follow the plot? Talk about this with your loved ones and your care team, especially. Executive function is exactly what it sounds like. It's what an executive would do who manages multiple departments, you know, in a big company would do. These are, this is the part of the brain that is particularly affected with Parkinson's. It's that frontal cortex, and it, it has to do with the decision-making, multitasking, problem-solving, organizing, planning. It's all the things that we do in our daily lives, and we just do them without thinking. However, in Parkinson's, that changes. So, in Parkinson's, as the disease progresses, it's very hard to make decisions. If you're a care partner, the best thing to do is to offer two, two alternatives. Instead of saying, John, where should we go out for dinner tonight? Say, John, should we go to Pizza Hut or Applebee's? And then John will be able to make that decision a lot easier. So, it can be overwhelming to have too many choices for a person with Parkinson's that the disease is progressing. Do you make poor decisions? That's another thing that happens in Parkinson's disease because of this executive functioning issue. Like, um, like not wearing a seatbelt when you are driving or as a passenger or spending more money than you should. Are you having more problems problem solving? Um, problem solving, like what should I make for dinner and I don't have anything in the refrigerator? That's a complicated task. And we don't necessarily think of it as complicated, but it has a lot of steps that need to be um, divided and, and conquered, actually. Is it harder to follow instructions or directions now? Do you need more time? to accomplish and do the tasks that you have? 
you know, making coffee in the morning is, is a complex set of tasks that we have to think about and orchestrate and, and complete. Um, are you having more trouble paying bills on time, writing checks correctly, trouble multitasking, switching between tasks, like if you're writing down your bills and then you hear the TV over there, it's harder to get back to paying those bills. That, that uh, multitasking can be very difficult. There's a saying that I've talked to my patients about, and it is, as Parkinson's progressive progresses, it is very difficult to walk and chew gum at the same time. Walking is a complex series of steps that needs to be thought about. And if you're chewing gum, very difficult to pick up those feet all the way. Or when you are walking into the living room from the kitchen, doing that is difficult enough, but carrying something like a tray of food, absolutely very, very difficult to do. So it's very important to talk to people about what you are experiencing. We don't want you having falls, which are a key problem with this disease. Memory, there's different types of memory that we're referring to when we look at uh, how memory changes in Parkinson's. So long-term memory, it has to do with memories that we keep for a number of days or life experiences and skills. And like the slide shows, experiences like knowing how to ride a bike. That's, that's long-term memory. Short-term memory has to do more with holding a little bit of information for a short period of time. Like if someone gives you the phone number 612-626-6688 and you say it over and over in your mind until you can get to a piece of paper to write that down, that's short-term memory. And then you've got working memory that uses the memories that you have to problem solve. So in this uh, slide example, it's like doing math. Language. Language is also a part of cognition. And it's how we make ourselves understood, how we're able to empathize and understand another person. Is it harder to find the word you're thinking of? Word finding is a very big issue with Parkinson's cognition as the disease progresses. Visual spatial skills. This is uh, an area too. Um, in the retinal cells, there are, there's dopamine receptors. And so as you know, with Parkinson's, it has to do with dopamine. And so visual spatial skills are affected. We take this for granted. And as Don, Dr. Jennifer Goldman states, these abilities tell us where things are around us in space. They give us a spatial map of our environment and involve our sense of direction. Visual spatial functions allow us to estimate distance and depth, use mental imagery, copy drawings, or construct objects or shapes. Examples can include things like giving someone directions to your house, tracing that route in your mind, uh, avoiding obstacles that are sitting right in your pathway, and putting together a puzzle. Those are all um, ways that this is impacted. So one care partner of mine actually said that when she had her husband empty the dishwasher, she would find plates and glasses and silverware all over different areas of the house. And this has to do with how you construct your environment. And so that can be affected with Parkinson's disease. There's also a decreased contrast sensitivity that occurs. And this is secondary to the loss of dopamine from those retinal cells. It can cause problems seeing contrast. So uh, that can be a, an issue with falls. And like I mentioned, stepping over objects. Double vision is another problem. And it has to do with coordinating our eyes to move together 
the muscles of our eyes. And when that is impaired, you can start to have double vision. It's usually intermittent and it can respond to, it can respond to some anti-Parkinsonian medications. And it occurs most office, often when you're reading or in close vision and in the evening when somebody is tired. So how does, what, are, what is the possibility of change with cognition in Parkinson's? Well, there are age-related changes. And then there is MCI, which stands for um, mul um, multiple cognition impairment, mul multiple domain cognitive impairment. And in the MCI category, there isn't any functional impairment. And what I mean by that is there's no problem with the person with MCI being able to take care of their, their activities of daily living, like bathing, eating, dressing, those types of things. There's no limitation that way, but MCI can stay the same. It can progress or it can even get better day to day. What I often hear in Parkinson's patients is that their care partners may say, Sally was, is fine on Monday and then on Tuesday she was very confused. I hear that a lot, sort of this up and down kind of thing. But as MCI progresses into dementia, this is a category where there are functional impairments, meaning that person with the dementia has a difficult time doing their activities of daily living, carrying out the tasks that are very important in our daily living. So that is what a progression would look like. And not everybody with Parkinson's will progress into this, but a large percentage. So, Sometimes people have said uh, percentages of up to 50% of people with Parkinson's as they have um, had their Parkinson's for a period of time will progress into dementia. Let's talk about these things, this mild cognitive impairment. These are changes that are greater than expected for a person's age. So the things on the right in the boxes I want you to look at, and these are what you want to think about when you start having those issues of having trouble watching TV, not being able to read a book. These are things that you want to think about. Talk about it. For sure, talk about it. And then we want to look for some cause that's reversible, that's not has to do with Parkinson's disease. We want to look at those medications and the supplements. We want to see what could be impacting the cognition of the patient. We want to also see if there are sleep problems, depression and, and anxiety. We want to be sure we treat those because those things are treatable. And we want to get you the right referrals so that you can work with the people that can help reverse or keep things the same or just help you in your daily life functioning. So if you're having trouble with cognition and, and you think that things have changed, you're going to be talking to your loved ones. You're going to talk and see your movement disorder specialist, and you're going to have a medication review. So there are a lot of medications that can impair thinking, a lot of medications. There's sedatives, there's narcotics, anticholinergic medications. Sedatives would be more like, um, like the benzodiazepines, uh, clonazepam, um, Valium, uh, that type of medication. Those, those can impact how you think. Narcotics, say you had hip surgery and you are given some Percocet, uh, a pain medication can impact your thinking. And then anticholinergic medications are those medications that have like a drying effect on the system. And some of those medications are things that we use to treat urinary problems. Um, 
some medications we use to treat tremor, like Artane, which is trihexaphenidyl, that's an anticholinergic medication that can cause thinking problems. Benztropine, that can cause a problem as well. When you talk to your movement disorder specialist about changes that you are experiencing, that person is going to want to always know what your symptoms are in relation to when you take your Parkinson's pills. This tells us if your symptoms are ha more have to do with wearing off of the medication, or is this more of a cognitive problem? So if it's wearing off, we might decide to bring the doses closer together. We may decide to increase a dose. We might decide to add a medication to the cocktail, whatever it is. So that's why it's so important for you to be able to let us know what your symptoms are in relation to when you took your medication. Also, we want you to address any hearing or vision problems. So absolutely wear your hearing aids, wear your glasses when you need to, um, and care partners might need to help remind people with Parkinson's to do that. Dementia in Parkinson's. So you, a person with Parkinson's has a higher risk of developing dementia the longer they've had Parkinson's disease. If they have more of the rigid walking and balance problem, Parkinson's characteristics rather than tremor. Um, if you have mild cognitive impairment, if you have hallucinations or delusions, absolutely have a higher risk of having dementia. So as I mentioned, probably 50% of people with Parkinson's will have dementia after 10 years of working with this disease. Other predictors include older age, being a male, uh, having the onset being bilateral instead of just the right side, we have both sides that are affected. Uh, REM behavioral sleep disorder is a predictor. Illusions, having orthostatic symptoms, feeling faint and falls, that type of thing. Depression, those give you uh, a higher risk. So there is a, a key thing that we need to talk about and it's not comfortable but it's something we have to talk about, and that is driving. People with Parkinson's need to understand that Parkinson's is a progressive neurodegenerative illness, and thinking is going to become affected. Now, driving is a very, very complex skill. It requires First of all, good movement, neck movement. It requires thinking ahead. It requires good vision, um, visual spatial skills, all these things that tend to deteriorate in Parkinson's. And so it's so important to have that conversation with family and with your movement disorder specialist about when is it time to give up the keys? Has there been a near miss recently? Maybe something to discuss with family is when you're willing to talk about it. Say, I'm gonna be willing to talk about this maybe in a year or whatever, or maybe family has been noticing things and they are concerned. It's not, just about your independence. And your independence is so important. And driving, if you have to give it up, is definitely, definitely something to grieve. But we have to think about others and the safety of the public and the people that are in the car with us or just simply riding their bicycle on the street next to us. So, Driving is a key thing that needs to be discussed. Another thing is cooking. 
sometimes when dementia has come about, people are forgetful of turning off the stove um, or burning themselves. So these are all safety issues and safety has to come first. Independence and personal self-esteem is critically important, absolutely. But safety of yourself and others has to come first. So people and families talk about the possibility of dementia before your person with Parkinson's has this problem. They may not have the problem at all. 50% don't, but 50% do. So it's important to have that discussion about when is it time to give up the keys? How can we talk to you about our concerns when we feel that it's time to have these key conversations? The other thing, this is the time too before dementia, when every single person, especially a person with Parkinson's disease, has a healthcare directive. Someone who will make key medical decisions when the person with Parkinson's is not able to make those decisions um, in, a, in a way that is uh, realistically good for them. So having a healthcare directive notarized and given to your primary care specialist or your neurologist, this is very different than a power of attorney. You've, I've heard patients say, I am so-and-so's power of attorney. You should be able to tell me all about his care. I'm sorry, I can't do that. Unless you are listed as um, authorized to discuss protected health information, or you have a healthcare directive that lists your name, I can't talk to you about so-and-so's care. Very important families to have this set up. All right, let's talk about what we can do and how we can make things a little bit better and, uh, and easier to understand. So communication strategies are key for families. As I mentioned before, when you are given too many um, options, it's very difficult for the person with Parkinson's to make a decision. So as cognition decreases, and perhaps we're into now the dementia phase of the illness, don't ask open-ended questions. Instead, ask multiple choice questions, like um, do you, want to go for a walk today? Yes or no? Um, the, the reason multiple choice questions are better or yes, no questions are better is because that cognitive area of making planning, decision-making can become more and more difficult. Let the person with Parkinson's have a choice on what they're gonna do that day. Before you speak with your person with Parkinson's, make sure that you have their attention and eye contact. So yelling at them from the kitchen and they're in the living room and you're having a conversation, that's not gonna work when a person with Parkinson's has um, more developed MCI or dementia. Too difficult, you need to gain their attention. Give the person with Parkinson's enough time to answer. So you've all, all heard about the motor symptom of bradykinesia, which is that slowness in movement. Well, there's slowness in thinking. It's called bradyphrenia. And the person with Parkinson's has the answer, but it's harder for them to find the file, okay? So they've got the answer to your question, but they need time to access that file. So try, very hard to do. And I had a, a care partner tell me that this is one of the things she has struggled with the most with her irritability and impatience. It's just easier if I do this, or it's just easier if I just take the reins. Yes, it is easier for you but it's not easier for the person with Parkinson's. We have to have dignity and respect and allow time for them to answer. 
be an active listener, look for cues and meanings. So when you have that eye contact with your person with Parkinson's and you're talking with them, try to, you're not gonna see a lot of facial expression because that has to do with that masked facies that they get with the facial muscles, but you can watch for eye movement. You can look for body language, um, anything that might help you. And in fact, some people have a, a communication worked out with their partners where um, the person with Parkinson just gives a, a like a hand motion. Yeah, I'm doing okay, or no, I'm not doing okay, or I'm above the line today, I'm below the line today, meaning their mood. Um, so have, that, have, think about some of the signals that you can work out together. All right. So there is a slippery slope. Um, in dementia, there's a possibility of starting to have illusion, hallucination, delusion. And it's not just during dementia. This can occur early in the disease as well. Um, it can occur in the middle with MCI, but it does occur a lot more often when dementia is in play. So, an illusion is where the person feels like there is a person or an intelligence that's in the room with them, but nobody is really there. Or the person with Parkinson's thinks they saw a small furry creature in their peripheral vision that just skittered by. Typically, it's a, a small furry creature, like a cat or a squirrel. Sometimes words, when they're reading a book, might start looking like ants crawling on a page instead of words or a tree at the end of the driveway is looking like a group of people that are waving their hands something like that um, so a hallucination is more of having this perception and there's no stimulus okay so there's no tree at the end of the driveway that looks like something else. There aren't any words on the book in the book turning into ants. So a hallucination is um, seeing and hearing, seeing or hearing or feeling or tasting things that are not there. And when we ask about hallucinations, we'll ask, does the person with Parkinson's have insight or do they not have insight? And insight refers to do you know that it's not real? So some people might say, oh yeah, I see a group of angels singing out the window on their bicycles. And you say, well, how, how do you know it's not real? Well, because I'm on the third floor. Um, I know that they're not out there. You know, So that's having insight. They know it's not real. Um, so, and some medications, in particular Parkinson's disease medications, can cause hallucination. Uh, amantadine is one of those medications that if I hear a patient uh, saying that they hear a choir, auditory hallucinations are not very typical. More, than, more often than not, it's a visual hallucination having to do with those visual spatial issues, I'm sure. Um, but with amantadine, we've noticed how some people have auditory hallucinations. It's very interesting. So some of you may have heard of Lewy body dementia. And how do we know if something is Lewy body dementia or it's Parkinson's disease dementia? If it's Lewy body dementia, typically the uh, visual hallucinations be, begin before the motor symptoms of the disease. And with Parkinson's disease dementia, the motor symptoms come first and visual hallucinations may not occur for a year or more later. So, but a very important question to ask always when somebody says they have seen something is ask if it's scary. 
this can determine whether to treat or not to treat. Um, if a person is seeing this cat that goes by and it doesn't bother them at all, there's really no cause to have to give another medication or to change medications if it's not bothering that person. But if it starts to become scary, that's, that's no way to live. And, and then it's definitely time to treat. So a delusion, that's, that's going even a step further. It's, it is that strong belief about something that is not true, very paranoid in nature. Commonly in Parkinson's disease, the delusion that I hear about is spousal infidelity. The person with Parkinson's believes that their spouse is having an affair with someone and you know, they are convinced of this. And this can cause great, great problems, as you can imagine. Another delusion that I hear about sometimes is capgrass delusion. It's where um, you think somebody is an imposter. So the person with Parkinson's may have their wife or husband sitting next to them, but they believe that that person is an imposter, that the real wife or husband is somewhere else. Um, so that's, that's interesting. I also hear sometimes where the person with Parkinson's believes that somebody is stealing things or out to get them or hiding things, rearranging things in the house. So these are all red flags. Very, very important to talk about this with your provider. You can see here um, an example of what kind of, this is more of an illusion because it has a, um, a stimulus and that stimulus is the trees on the hill and the person with Parkinson's may have the hallucination that it's children playing up there on the hill. But these hallucinations and so forth are almost always visual. And they're usually small people, children, furry animals, and like I said, non-threatening in nature, and usually a side effect of the medication. They're more common late at night or early in the morning, and often when the person is falling asleep or waking up very commonly. Um, so it's, it's just so important to treat these things. It can be life-changing and one of the major reasons why care partners get to the point of burnout and key reason why patients with Parkinson's go into care facilities. So treatment for hallucinations and delusions to treat or not to treat. First thing first, we want to look at, let's look at that word psychosis. So the first thing we want to look at is the PD, the Parkinson's disease medications. Okay. Are they on amantadine? Are they on a dopamine agonist? Those are much more likely to cause these issues. If so, we may discontinue one, change up the medication in some way. The other thing we always want to look at is any systemic illness. Um, is there anything going on you know, with the patient as far as, do they are they losing weight? Um, in the last month, have they lost all kinds of weight? Do, could they have cancer brewing? You know, some, some kind of systemic thing. Uh, centrally acting medications are like those anticholinergics I, met, I mentioned. Um, the things that we use to help with urinary urgency frequency, like, like uh, tolteridine or oxybutynine. Looking at tricyclic dis, uh, antidepressant medication, Benadryl, you know, even. So we look at those centrally acting medications. The second thing, hepatic, renal, or metabolic dysfunction. Look at that. Any overdose of narcotic or benzo or even carbidopa levodopa, just kind of too much medication can cause hallucinations and delusions. Sensory deprivation. Are they 
using their hearing aids? Are they using their glasses? Is there an infection? Honestly, this is the first thing I think about when I get a call from a care partner, when there's a sudden increase in hallucinations. It's so often it's a urinary tract infection and we don't see the, um, the symptoms of that as burning upon urination or fever or anything like that. But what we do see are falls or changes in cognition and hallucinations, that type of thing. So infection is absolutely something we look at. These are treatable things. This is, the person is not having a hallucination because they're progressing in their Parkinson's disease. This is, these are reasons that we can look at to um, treat and, and help hopefully those hallucinations, delusions, and cognitive impairment can get better. Um, pneumonia is another infection that we want to look at. And a structural lesion would be more like if the person has had a fall lately and hit their head, they could have a subdural hematoma in the brain, something like that, a stroke. Any of those things can cause changes in mentation. Very, very important. At this point, absolutely do not have any firearms in your home. Get rid of the firearms. Make sure that you reassure your person with Parkinson's that the hallucination is a trick of the mind and it's probably caused by medications. It's probably not them losing their mind, which is frightening beyond belief. So remind them that it's probably the medications. And then we have medications that help with treating hallucinations. Now, let's look at some of the things that we can do to lessen the impact of hallucinations or, if, or dementia for that fact. If you are taking care of someone with Parkinson's that has dementia and has progressed into this phase, you wanna keep a very calm, quiet environment. You don't want political shows on TV. You don't want the news, which can be very upsetting even loud TV, violent programs. You can watch uplifting shows together. You know, I love Lucy. That's, that's even before my time, but um, there are nostalgic kind of television shows that you can watch together. And have a lavender diffuser or freshener. Even that is helpful for the care partner to help keep you um, in that right frame of mind as well. Have a routine, absolutely have a routine. Maybe have a whiteboard that you have listed what the activities are for that day. Um, again, make sure that your person with Parkinson's has their glasses and their hearing aids. And um, you know, in the late afternoon, it says here on the slide, lower the shades. It's late afternoon, you've probably heard the word, the term sundowning. And that is when the light is changing in the environment and because of the visual spatial problems, shadows look like other things. And, and so make sure the environment is well lit and there aren't shadows in different areas of your home. So how do you, how do you deal with a delusion? So let's say your person is, uh, right then and there having a very difficult time and is paranoid and freaking out, what can you do? Well, one thing you can do is you can, you can kind of test, you can tell the person with Parkinson's, tell the intruder to back off, or you can do it yourself. So, hey, get out of the house, back off. And, um, you can ask the, you can actually ask that hallucination. Um, you can ask the person with Parkinson's, where is the hallucination? What are you seeing? Not that you're agreeing with it, but you're asking them for clarification. 
what are you seeing? Where are they standing? And you could actually just say, hey, it's time to go now and pretend you're ushering that hallucination out of the door. Sometimes that helps. We need to change the things we can because there's so much that we can't change. So I was just giving you some um, examples of reframing and redirecting. Don't argue. Don't argue with the person with Parkinson's. Ask them specifically what they are seeing. If they're having a delusion, don't buy into it, but don't agree with it either. Just ask non-intense probing questions to learn more about what the person believes and, and why. Remind them often that they are safe and secure and that you are on their side. Aim to turn the negative into a positive and cast a different light on the experience. So for instance, I saw that guy before and he's really harmless. He's here to keep us safe. That's one way to look at it. Or yeah, he first looked like a bad guy, but he's actually very friendly. And then move on to a different topic. You can direct the conversation away from something. Like let's say the person with Parkinson's is seeing, uh, let's say a high school band out in the field playing music. You could say, oh, well, what kind of instrument did you play when you were in high school? And start redirecting the conversation to something else. So you're not concentrating on the hallucination. Those are some ideas to do together. So treatment for this dementia that we're talking about, we want to look at the treatable conditions. As I mentioned, we want to look at systemic illnesses, infections. We want to make sure they have their glasses and hearing aids and um, you know, all those things that we talked about already. We probably will have to change the Parkinson's medications. Um, we want to look at social stressors. Maybe there are certain things going on in their lives right now. Like maybe you have to move out of your house. That's very stressful. Physical exercise needs to be done to expend some of this energy as well. So those are things that we need to do. And don't forget the person that's taking care of the patient. And that's you, caregivers. This is so very, very important. You need to get the right care at the right time. Make sure that you look at your resources. The APDA, the Parkinson's Foundation, Michael J. Fox website, um, you know, those are all great things. Caregiving classes. Make sure that you're meeting with a social worker to talk about planning ahead. Get those documents in line that you're going to need. Make sure you take care of your own emotions. Talk to everybody and be open and be sure that you honor yourself. Be sure you put the oxygen mask on yourself first or you won't even be there for the person with Parkinson's. Love yourself and you guys are doing a great job. And I'm so glad that you were here today to see the presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susan. I think your talk really resonated with people. We've had a lot of questions come rolling in. So let's get started. All right. Our first question, someone has asked, can deep brain stimulation help improve cognition? No, the answer is simply no. It's not meant to improve cognition at all. And in fact, any brain surgery can impair cognition. That's a risk. Great, thank you for answering that. And someone else has asked, how or when can you set a baseline early on in order to judge changes in cognition later? Well, when a person is diagnosed with Parkinson's, it's always a good idea to 
ask the provider for referrals for a neuropsychological evaluation, speech therapy, physical therapy, and occupational therapy right away, even when the symptoms aren't very bad, because this gives a very good baseline. But as time goes on, if there are questions or concerns, um, a shorter referral to an occupational therapist can help with uh, doing a co cognitive testing. Uh, neuropsychological evaluation is a much more involved test that's uh, four to five hours long, but the uh, OT can, can pick up on things as time goes on, so OT referral. Great, that's good to know. And someone else has asked, what are some good ways to keep track of symptom changes? That's a great question. Um, the APDA has a symptom tracker that is very helpful. And you can contact your local APDA or go online and see if you can download the PDF and actually print it out. But this is such a helpful tool to use when you're trying to get the most out of an appointment with your movement disorder provider. There's such a limited amount of time in that appointment and you need to be able to pinpoint what's going on. And as I said in the presentation, knowing what your symptoms are in relation to when you take your pills is absolutely key. So these symptom trackers, some offices like our office, has them for you. We can send them to you through my chart or uh, your healthcare website. Uh, and as mentioned before, you can get them through the APDA. Yeah, absolutely. And I want to add that if anyone would like to keep track of their symptoms using their phone, APDA has a symptom tracker app available on the App Store for Apple and non Apple Android phones. Wonderful. Yeah. So someone else has chimed in with, how can I get help untangling legal terms like healthcare directive and power of attorney? Yes, well, social workers are the angels in this area. They can help in all stages. Also, the uh, Agency for Aging, um, you can contact them as well. They have people that can help with that. But basically it's very important to understand that power of attorney, that general phrase is referring to the business financial aspects of a person. And so if so-and-so has power of attorney of Jim, they can handle the financial matters. That doesn't mean that they can even talk to me about the health matters. Of Jim. So the healthcare directive is that document that all of us should have filled out. And it's a it's those the the final wishes of what we would like to happen in our end time. And the important time to fill that out is when you can really think about it and make those choices with a sound mind and choose who is going to make those decisions for you when you cannot. The other uh, document I mentioned is an authorization to discuss protected health information. Very important that when you go to the office to see your movement disorder team, ask to fill out that form. That way, if the caregiver needs to speak with me regarding what's going on with the person with Parkinson's, I can talk to them. If this isn't filled out, I cannot even admit that that person is a patient of mine. So those three things, authorization to discuss protected health information, a healthcare directive, and then the power of attorney is different. Thank you. That was a fabulous explanation of those terms. And I think that's really helpful for everyone to know. Someone else has asked, how do you help a person who is in denial about their changes in cognitive symptoms? Oh, that's really tough. Uh, when family members are afraid to bring up things like 
driving with the person because driving is such an in, it's a such an indicator of independence and it's part of our personal dignity that independence to be able to drive where we want to and there is this denial many times and for good reason uh, not wanting to give up that independence so oftentimes the care provider is asking us the the neurology clinic or the um, neurologist to be the bad guy and that's okay bring it up during one of your appointments with the movement disorder specialist uh, or or give them a heads up before the appointment and and just give them a clue would you please bring up this issue we can also do what's called a MOCA exam in the visit where it's a short form that I would provide with the patient and we would go through some things on the form and it gives a very quick estimation of the cognitive ability at that moment in time. Anything under 26 is concerning. So um, that's a one quick way to, to have that done. Great, thank you. And someone else has asked, when is it time to look for a nursing home and how far ahead should you plan for nursing home admission? Like one year or okay. so on? So nursing home admission is not for sure needed. Uh, it, it all depends on the individual with the Parkinson's disease. So the saying that if you've met one person with Parkinson's, you've met one person with Parkinson's because everybody is so very unique. So, but if you start seeing signs of mild cognitive impairment, usually uh, I have to say when it comes to the motor symptoms of Parkinson's, when patients have a very difficult time moving and that kind of thing, that doesn't put people into a nursing home situation usually. Care partners can usually handle that type of thing at home. It's when the behaviors begin due to cognitive impairment. Um, the irritability that can happen with uh, the patient uh, based upon their fear of the hallucinations or delusions that they're experiencing. So that can cause some behaviors. And that's what typically takes people to the nursing home point. So I would say that the time to start thinking about it is when, when a person has their faculties and just talk to them openly about here's Parkinson's disease. These are some of the risks that we're going to be facing in the future. I know that you love us, you love your family, and, and that you want us to be in good stead as this disease progresses. How should we handle this situation? And, you know, most people would not want to go into a care facility. There's very many different kinds of facilities. So it's not necessarily a nursing home. There are Parkinson's disease specialty homes where it's more like a group home setting. But uh, the time to plan is not during a crisis. You, that is not the time to prepare. If you have a, a loved one who is already experiencing these hallucinations or dementia, it's time to talk to a social worker. And we have them at the clinic. Most clinics, I would think, have a social worker to talk to for advanced care planning. Great, Susan, I really liked your idea that you shared about how to start that conversation with your loved one. So I think that's the hardest thing sometimes is just knowing how to broach that. So thank you for giving us your thoughts on that. And someone else has asked, I've noticed that I've been having problems with my attention lately. Do you have tips for how to improve attention and focus? Yes. Uh, in fact, I have problems with my attention too. And I think it's very, very important to stay physically active. And physical exercise is one of those things we stress in Parkinson's disease management. It's going to help your body, your mind, and your soul. Uh, so absolutely 
do your daily exercise. Try to get 15, 20 minutes of aerobic activity every day. Another thing you can do is to start uh, learning a new language, start a hobby, use parts of your brain that uh, need to have push-ups done, you know, keep learning, keep learning, very, very important. And get rest. If you're having trouble with your sleep, that will impact your cognition. So bring that up with your provider if you're having trouble with sleep. Great. And I just want to let everyone know our next question will be our last question. But someone else has asked, is there anything I can do to prevent MCI from progressing into dementia or to improve MCI in general? That's hard to say, but as I mentioned earlier, the, the key thing is exercise, keep moving, keep that heart uh, pumping and, you know, go to an occupational therapist, get a referral for that so you can learn ways to, to cope with any kind of lessening of uh, attention and, and some of the executive functioning things. Do mind puzzles, um, do things to challenge your brain. Great. Well, that's all the time we have, but on behalf of all of us, I want to thank you for sharing your presentation. We can all see your passion for this topic, and we're so grateful that you took the time to share this expertise with our Parkinson's community today. So thank you. I am so grateful for the opportunity. Thank you. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Bye. Bye.
everyone. Thanks for joining me. I am Paige Green. I am a registered dietitian with High V. Um, I actually spoke last year. It was crazy to think that, um, you know, that was just last year, but yeah, it was 2019 during the summer. So for those of you maybe rejoining, uh, thanks again. And for those new faces, I hope that you um, take away lots of different tips and tricks and kind of nutritional advice that I have for you today. But I have been a high registered dietitian for almost four years, and I see lots of different disease states, everything from um, diabetes, weight management, um, food allergies has definitely been a popular one as of late. Um, but I really do love sharing my expertise on different types of um, different types of diets, including a Parkinson's one. So today I'm going to talk about the good mood food, um, eating well with Parkinson's disease. So um, hopefully you guys stick around and it, I will answer questions at the very end. So we'll go ahead and get started. But food for thought, um, I get asked all the time, you know, what is the best diet for XYZ for a diabetic for those who are looking to lose weight? For those of um, someone who maybe have Parkinson's disease. And fortunately or unfortunately, kind of depending on how you see it, um, there is no prescription or a specific diet for Parkinson's disease. Um, so really the main takeaway, if you take one thing away from this presentation is variety, variety, variety. And I can't stress that enough. And really, I, you'll see this on the screen and I have it here with me today. Um, I really use this my plate as a tool. So when we were in school, we learned about the food pyramid, right? Um, the carbohydrates were on the very, very bottom and it went all the way up to that tiny triangle that included the sweets and oils. Now kids are learning this my plate and there's one more imaginary um, food group up here, as you can see on the slide, dairy. And it just showcases kind of when you sit down at whatever meal, breakfast, lunch, or dinner, you can visually see, does your plate look like the my plate. Um, and it really just shows that, you know, we really want to aim for more color on our plate. Portions are really important. Um, and if anything, try to aim for three out of the five food groups at every single meal. And I'll kind of show you or tell you why um, I really am a big advocate for that in a little bit. But that healthy and balanced mindset, um, it will really help with that maintaining that healthy weight. Um, so again, no specific combination of foods have been shown to slow the progression, um, but just trying to make sure that you keep more variety in the back of your mind. And we're going to really hone in on these fruits and vegetables food groups in here in a little bit too, but that can really help kind of help our energy levels, help kind of ease some of those symptoms too. So we'll, we'll go ahead and chat more about that in a second, but kind of some nutritional tips for memory fitness. So again, Balanced eating is really the name of the game for, for really just general overall health, but again, for Parkinson's disease, especially just to kind of help with some of those symptoms and again, that brain health. So some of those foods that really hone in on the brain health are fats, um, and especially those heart-healthy omega-3 fatty acids. You may have heard of them, um, but once upon a time, you know, fat was super, super feared. Um, and again, it's just making sure that we're selecting those correct types of fats. So those heart healthy omega-3 fats. So a lot of times people will think of fish. And if you're not eating fish every single week, um, I encourage you to do so at least twice a week. Um, and if not, um, there's lots of different supplements on the market, um, fish oil or an omega-3 supplement. And I really encourage about a thousand milligrams of an omega-3 um, every single day if you don't feel like you're getting enough fish or seafood into your diet plan. As you can see behind me, I brought a lot of different uh, foods just to kind of highlight and showcase to you today. So kind of throughout the presentation, I'll be picking and choosing. But as you can see here, um, you know, sometimes the seafood counter can be a little intimidating or you're just not sure what to select. So go into the middle aisles, canned tuna. It's awesome. It's great. They're actually making different types of tuna that are already using some different seasonings in here. 
They even have pouch salmon. I'm sorry for the glare. Um, but these are really convenient too, that you can, you know, I like to mix mine with hummus or um, actually guacamole or mayo is fine too, but um, give it a little stir. You can put it in a nice, you know, pita pocket over a couple slices of bread or top it on a couple um, or a big bed of salad greens too for a really heart healthy lunch. And these guys are fairly new. If you guys have never seen these, these are infused tuna cups. Um, they're really great. They're even portable. They have a spork inside. So that's kind of fun. Uh, but this is a really good source of, um, of omega-3s, 20 grams of protein in this little guy. They come in five different flavors. But if you feel like cooking is maybe a struggle for you, you're just not really sure um, what to cook or don't like to even be in the kitchen, Tuna is a really, really easy lunch or dinner idea as well. So, um, you know, I, I mentioned a pita pocket, but I love putting them on wraps as well. So these mission carb conscious or carb balance um, tortillas are really great as well. Um, we're going to talk about fiber here in a little bit. And these guys are a really good source of fiber. So just another option that you could throw your tuna right onto. Kind of a different type of, you know, getting past seafood or tuna in general, um, some different types of healthy fats that contain those omega-3 fatty acids are going to be your chia seeds, flax seeds, or walnuts. Maybe these words have, you know, you've heard of them, um, you've seen them in different things, or maybe in the menu at places. Um, but chia seeds, flax seeds, those are really, really great, simple to add to smoothies to oatmeal. Um, I love adding them to yogurt as well. They don't change the flavor of foods. Um, if it sits out too long, you'll notice the texture kind of start to um, get a little bit thicker. But um, again, it's just a really easy add. And they're really great in, in regards to omega-3s and actually a plant-based calcium source too. So good for the bone health as well. So moving right along the middle bullet there, veggies. Um, again, back to this my plate. The goal is to eat half our plate full of fruits and or vegetables every single day. So a lot of times people are like, well, what's the recommendation? Well, it's five servings. Um, and if you currently only do one, or maybe you don't do any, I don't want you to start doing five tomorrow. I mean, you might want to try, but Again, try to be realistic with yourself and see where you can add a fruit or vegetable into your day. Maybe it's, hey, starting tomorrow, I'm going to really, really hone in on, and, on including a vegetable at every single lunch. Um, in a little bit, I'm going to show you different ways or easy ways to add that. But the really good, the really good health benefits of, of fruits and vegetables are those antioxidant properties. Um, each color rep represents a different antioxidant, which helps in turn um, kind of fight off those free radicals and helps with inflammation, um, again, with heart health, um, brain health. So a lot of good um, research backing those up. Plus, they're full of water and fiber, and we want to keep everything moving right along in our system. So um, including some fruits and vegetables at every meal is, you know, really the, the goal, but Again, if you're currently doing maybe maybe one or two servings every single day, try adding one more and working your way up to that five a day. And then last point there, just practice moderation. You know, you probably always have heard, you know, everything in moderation. And it is true. Um, you know, just like excess salt and sugar are bad for our bodies, eating too much of something can be really harmful for our brains. Um, plus, you know, with too much sugar, that can lead to just us feeling tired, sluggish. It just weighs us down. Sometimes brain fog can occur too. So really hone in and think, gosh, my energy levels are just really, really, really low. Maybe it's we're not eating enough of the color and maybe too much of the sugar. And a little bit, we'll kind of chat about different ways to, to swap out uh, some of those sweet cravings too. So again, here's kind of the five of day, just really want to make sure that I'm hitting this point across that we really do need to make sure that we're getting in enough fruits and vegetables every single day. So three servings of vegetables look like one cup of raw or cooked, 
a cup of 100% vegetable juice. So I have a lot of clients who will have a VA alongside their breakfast in the morning, and that's definitely very doable. And then two cups of leafy greens. And then for fruit, what a serving looks like for that, a cup of fresh or frozen, a cup of 100% fruit juice, and a half cup dried fruit. Now I will say I'm not a big advocate of fruit juice because I really do believe that getting the, the fruit and the fiber from the whole, whole fruit itself is going to be a little bit better. So kind of just try to aim for more of the, the actual whole fruit than the juice form. For those of you who haven't been over to the frozen foods department, I encourage you to do so. I know it's getting chilly outside, so brave the cold and kind of peek, peek open those doors because there are a lot of new products over there. At the location that I'm at, we have actually seven doors full of frozen vegetable products, and it's, it's awesome. I will say in our household, 95% of our vegetables that we purchase come from the frozen foods department. So just as nutritious as the, um, as the fresh, it's just, it's going to help you if you can't get to a whole head of broccoli quickly, um, you know, then you don't have to toss it out and that will, you know, essentially cost you more money. So some different ones that maybe you guys have tried some of these products. They have been around, I guess, for a couple of years now, they used to be new. So this slide is a little old, but, um, riced vegetables. So up there, um, you'll see those rice cauliflower or rice sweet potatoes. Those are really easy. And I love these because um, we just toss these in our chili or different soups. Um, you really can't tell that they're in there. It's just boosting up that veggie consumption a little bit more. They're also great because you can steam those right in the bag. So they're an easy add to any dinner. Um, right there in the middle, those oven roasters. If you've never tried these, I encourage you to do so. These are awesome. There's like four different flavors. Um, this one showcased is the broccoli and cauliflower. Um, we just did the sweet potato carrot a couple of weeks ago, and that was really good. Um, but you just get out a big baking sheet. Um, they're already seasoned. They're already cut up for you. Um, and you bake them for 18 minutes and you've got a really nice roasted vegetable that you can, again, add alongside any dinner idea that you're doing. Um, the dual salad kits, I will say a lot of different brands have come out with these guys, um, but that's an easy add to any meal as well. Um, having a side salad, I always encourage, you know, trying to maybe get um, another bag of whether it's like a uh, a spinach or a kale and kind of bulking this salad kit up. Um, I take these a lot for lunches too. So again, easy to add on tuna to these guys, or you could do rotisserie chicken on top. Um, chickpeas are another really good source of protein too, but that's an easy add to any salad. Over there too, you'll see veggie tops. Um, that's right. So just like potatoes, but um, instead of the actual potato, they're actually replacing it with broccoli. Um, they have broccoli and cauliflower. There's a sweet potato one and we make a veggie top casserole out of these guys. Um, and again, they're just an easy add to, to really any dishes that you're doing. Um, a little bit more fiber found in these guys too. So again, frozen is going to be a, a really good place to kind of hit up when you're trying to increase your veggie consumption. All right, so we did want to kind of hit again on that sugar. Um, so I always just encourage people to kind of go through their, their general day, a typical day of eating, and really just kind of start saying, you know, I'm going to look at food labels. I'm going to see how much added sugar is found in different things. And um, it, you might be surprised on how much sugar you're actually consuming without you even realizing it, because I'm not going to sugarcoat it. We are eating too much sugar. Um, the average American actually eats 22 teaspoons every single day. So if you can envision a half a teaspoon or excuse me, a half a cup um, of sugar, that's 22 teaspoons. So it's way too much. Uh, the American Heart Association actually recommends no more than nine teaspoons of added sugar for men a day and no more than six teaspoons of added sugar for women. So when I say added sugar, I'm not talking about the natural sugar that's coming from fruit because, right, fruit is naturally sweet. 
Um, and then dairies are all, our other food group that's going to actually already have that natural sugar found in there. So that nine teaspoons for men and six teaspoons for women, um, that's just the added sugar. So here are some just different tips and tricks that you can just to kind of see, you know, how can I reduce my overall sugar content? And I will say that um, our sweetened beverages, that's going to be the main culprit where we're finding a lot of those, those sugar um, or the sugary types of drinks or food. So sodas, energy drinks, sweetened teas, um, you know, coffee shops, you can't go past a Starbucks without seeing a line out the door at all hours of the day. So it's crazy to, um, to see how much sugar is found in some of these drinks, but lots of different substitutions. If you're not a big water drinker, I really do encourage maybe doing a carbonated flavor water, um, bubbly, LaCroix, Zevia, Bi, those are all different types of sparkling or flavored waters. Even just taking a lemon or a lime and squeezing that into some, some water can just really help awaken it and not have it be so bland. Um, but I really do encourage trying to drink more water in your day. And we'll talk about kind of the water goal later on. Um, but if you're currently doing a soda or doing several sodas a day, again, going cold turkey, sometimes that works for people, but um, I'm a big advocate on kind of those, the forming those healthier habits. So maybe you're doing six cans of regular soda. Maybe tomorrow we start doing four and next week we'll do three and kind of work your way down and trying to increase that water intake. Again, just talking about the, um, the coffees here, a caramel macchiato from Starbucks. Check that out, 33 grams of sugar and that's just in the grande. So um, it's definitely gonna be a little bit more than that that nine or six teaspoons of added sugar every single day. And that's just a beverage that you're drinking. That might not be the stone or whatever you're putting alongside with it. Halloween, right? That just came and went. And I don't know about you, still have a bucket of candy at our house. Um, but the great thing about Halloween candy is they are fun sized, right? Even though some people are saying, well, there's nothing fun sized about fun sized candy bars. But it does, it keeps them in portion, but it's when we have too much of it. Um, and I will say if, if you can't have the sweets in the house because you know you're going to eat them, maybe it's not purchasing them and you're just going out for those types of treats every now and then. Um, but a really good way just to replace some of that candy is maybe with, you know, making your own trail mix. Maybe it's mixed nuts with dried fruit. Um, I do lots of different cereals. So whether it's Cheerios or Kix, um, those are all great options. This is probably one of my favorite products. Um, they are cocoa dusted almonds. Um, you can have a fourth of a cup of these, no added sugar, but it gives you that cocoa or that chocolate fix that you're looking for. Um, and again, a really easy add to any homemade trail mix or just eat them all alone or pair it with a piece of fruit too. So those are found in the nut aisle. Um, and then these guys are just another option too when you're wanting maybe like a candy bar, snicker bar, something. Again, it's a high V brand, um, but a lot of times people don't really like when I suggest, you know, maybe a health market granola or yeah, granola bar because they're a little bit pricier. These are really, really reasonably priced. Um, a good source of fiber and protein and the sugar content, super, super low. But again, you get a little bit of chocolate in there too. So those are found in the regular aisle as well. Sometimes we think that maybe sauces or condiments, salad dressings, those are all going to be fair game, right? Wrong. If you feel like, or if you've never looked at the back of a food label on one of those guys, definitely check it out. It's, it's eye-opening to see how much sugar is packed inside of barbecue sauces, even tomato sauces. It's like, why are you adding so much sugar to those products? So a lot of companies have gotten smart because we have become a little bit more health conscious. And they're making a lot of products that don't have so much added sugar. So um, try out some maybe hummus or guacamole. Herbs and spices can really flavor dishes, um, you know, without all the added sugar as well. So keep those in mind too. Um, sugary cereals. Um, again, something that a lot of people wake up and you pour, very easy, very convenient. But I promise you, oatmeal takes 
just as much time as cereal. And again, I'm gonna show you a really easy, convenient product. Um, this one actually is sweetened with a little bit of maple and brown sugar, but the sugar content still significantly low. You add it with a little bit of milk or water, pop it in the microwave for 30 to 45 seconds. And you've got a really, really easy breakfast idea that's gonna be filling. Um, and again, not have so much of the sugar crash later on. I always truly believe that you start your day off with what you have for breakfast um, and that kind of sets the tone for the rest of the day. Um, and then just number seven, I really wanted to, to shout out because people always ask me about, you know, ketchup, mustard, things like that. And I know we're kind of getting out of the um, barbecue grilling season, but a good swap for ketchup is salsa. So seven grams of sugar in ketchup versus one and a half grams in two tablespoons of um, salsa. So that's a really, really easy swap, something that is still really tasty on burgers, on eggs, um, but again, keeping that sugar content low. So like mentioned, if you're not checking out the food labels um, with different products or drinks that you are currently consuming, I really, really strongly encourage you to do so or just like just to see what are you putting in your body. Um, and up here on the screen, I have an old label and a new label. And what I mean by old is a lot of products have already made the swap to this new label. Um, by January 2021, I feel like I've been talking about this change for years now, but come here in a few months, all companies have to make the swap to this new label. Um, so what you can see is the calories are huge, right? Bolded, that's where your eyes went first. Um, but I always tell people to check out the serving size and see what exactly is a serving of this particular food. I'm not sure what this food label is, but um, you can see, sorry, my face is in front of it. The serving size on this particular um, nutritional fact is a half of a cup. So the other big Thing that I want to just point out is from the old label to the new label is it lists total sugars and then underneath it it has added sugars. So again that natural sugar found in fruit and dairy does not count towards your total of nine teaspoons and six teaspoons. So this is really helpful for whether this be a granola bar or maybe it is some oatmeal that has some like dried fruit in it. Um, it only has eight grams of added sugar. So I keep saying teaspoons and the food label shows up as grams. So the magical number to divide by to get the grams from a food label converted is four. So eight grams divided by four is two teaspoons of added sugar towards your six teaspoons for women and your nine teaspoons for men. So I hope that makes sense and definitely ask questions later on if it doesn't. So this is just a slide. I feel like a lot of people just have questions about different snacks. Um, again, we talked about fruits and vegetables early on and you know, really trying to encourage more of those on your plate at meals. Uh, but if you feel like you can't get a fruit or a vegetable at your meal, I really encourage you to think about what you're doing for a snack. So these are really, a lot of really great ideas. Um, you know, I mentioned the, the hummus and the carrots earlier on, but it could be as sim simple as peanut butter and an apple. Again, nuts and um, you know, citrus is really in season at this time. Whole grain crackers. And I wanna highlight a couple of my favorite ones. So um, Triscuit crackers or wheat thins make really, really great options for snacks or alongside a lunch option um, in place of chips. Because again, chips just really are just air, salt, and fat. Um, and these guys are made with whole grains. So that's gonna pack in a lot of different um, nutrients there, fiber being one of them, um, and protein, a little bit of protein too. So keeping this alongside maybe a cheese stick or pairing it with a piece of fruit, these are going to make really great options. Um, Triscuits has a lot of different flavors out there and the wheat thins have kind of followed suit and having a lot of different flavors too with those. Another chip option, these have been really popular in my house. 
I have a one-year-old and we're so we're always experimenting with new foods. But those veggie straws that are out on the market, unfortunately, hate to break it to you, don't include vegetables. But these guys, which are called Harvest Snacks, um, are either made with lentils or black beans as their number one ingredient, but you can't taste them. Um, they come in a lot of different flavors. Um, they have everything from a lightly salted, there's a white cheddar, there's a Caesar. This tomato basil is a really, really good one, one of my favorites. But you can have 24 of them um, and you can have, it'll give you three grams of fiber and five grams of protein. And again, they are made from veggies versus the actual veggie straws. So give these a shot. Um, they're really, really, really good. <clears throat> um, Laura bars. Making sure I get to all my goodies back here. Um, Laura bars make a really, really great snack as well. Um, again, when I say protein plus carbs equals a smart snack, um, that just provides you again with that fiber filling nutrient there, keeps us regular. And then again, that protein kind of keeps us feeling um, fuller longer. So these are going to be really great options. And if you've never heard of an RX bar, um, they're very simple ingredients, but again, just very uh, nutrient rich and a really great option for a snack if you're looking for something quick and wanting something on the go as well. So I do just want to talk about maybe some different dietary changes that you might have to do to help kind of ease some of those um, Parkinson's disease symptoms. So um, I've heard it a lot, you know, people will have some, a loss of appetite. This may make them lose weight and have kind of more of that weakened immune system. So some tips and ways to kind of come around or get around that lost appetite is really trying to encourage the small, more frequent meals. So I'm a big advocate for breakfast, but again, trying to fit in a large amount right away in the morning might lead to not be wanting to eat later on. So maybe it's something small and then a few hours later you eat something again and keep that trend going. So every two to three hours you're eating something. Um, trying more spicy food can really help stimulate our appetite too. So cayenne pepper, um, you know, more of a hot sauce or a hot salsa might kind of help you want to stimulate more of that appetite too. And then people with maybe that loss of appetite or that nausea is kind of pairing some of those um, carbohydrates with some healthy fats, whether it be nuts, nut butter, avocados, those are going to all be some helpful tips just to kind of encourage more of that regular eating as well. Um, I do want to just recommend that sometimes we get in that rut where we're, we're kind of stagnant, we're sedentary all day long. And, you know, make sure you're, you're getting up, you're staying active. Um, I know it's getting colder outside. So when I say walk around the block, uh, that sounds less and less appealing at this time, but um, even if it's getting up during commercial break, standing up, sitting back down, um, having some dumbbells maybe by your chair and doing that every commercial break, just something to kind of keep your bones and your body moving because I really do believe that, you know, if we, we become stagnant, then we just, the less that we use our body and that, you know, the more we just ate later. So keep moving. That's going to be really, really important. Um, if you experience difficulty swallowing, maybe due to tremor or stiffness, maybe it's in, you know, looking more for the softer, dif softer foods. So anything from bananas, yogurt, I love, I love Greek yogurt as a snack. Um, the Greek yogurt does have twice as much protein as regular yogurt. So that will kind of give you a more bang for your buck too. Um, soften some meats with gravy and then again encouraging more of those vegetables and doing them in the in the microwave that's going to all promote the soft foods but still kind of eating more of a nutritional diet um did someone say milkshakes so I did include that but when people you know we talk about milkshakes or ice cream dishes I always just say you know something that tastes just as great as a milkshake is a smoothie but you could make it more um more nutritional by, you know, doing frozen fruit. Again, whether it's putting chia seeds in there, you could do yogurt or regular milk, almond milk, um, but blend it all together and you get a lot of great nutrition coming from that. And again, it's just a softer, more palatable food for you. Um, 
more bland foods are going to really help with that nausea. So toast, rice, eggs, um, that's a big one. Very easy to whip together as well. Um, chicken, potatoes. My go-to is taking a regular potato or a sweet potato, poking it with a knife or a fork, pop it in the microwave um, for about five to seven minutes, depending on the size of it. And it's a really, really easy way to add a side along to dinner or uh, my go-to in college was then popping some peanut butter on top of the sweet potato with a little bit of cinnamon. And that was a really great um, breakfast idea too. If you have fatigue, this is just, I laugh because a lot of times I get this question where, you know, I just am so tired. Is there a pill that I can take? Um, and I always just come back to, are we drinking enough water and are we eating enough produce? So really think more color. Um, again, those antioxidants, those are, those are gonna be really important just to kind of help release some of those um, vitamins that help with energy. And again, just kind of keep us from not having too much sugar in our diet as well, because we'll fill up more on those and less on the sugary types of foods later on. And then don't skip meals. Um, again, if it's 10 o'clock and you haven't had anything, you might be hungry and you might feel tired because you just haven't nourished your body with anything yet. So really strive to keep eating um, every three to four hours. Snacks are important. Um, and again, trying to encourage more of a fruit or a vegetable alongside that snack can help with the energy as well. In regards to bone thinning, um, it's part of aging, but really kind of think calcium, magnesium, vitamins D and K. Those are going to be all bone um, forming nutrients that we need. Um, again, back to chia seeds. All, they're a great source of omega-3s. They're great for fiber, but they're also a really great plant-based source of calcium as well. So keep this in mind. Um, again, it's something easy to add to anything. I even will sprinkle these on salad. So whatever you're, you're currently eating, two tablespoons a day is kind of the recommendation. Um, but you get 10 grams of fiber out of the, out of the deal too. So um, this is a really good source of calcium as well. Um, again, the strong bones is just going to be really, really important for people living with Parkinson's disease just to help them prevent those fractures if a fall were to happen later on. Um, and then again, walking other weight bearing exercises to keep bones strong. So that's going to be important. Um, if you can get out and about, great, but um, we even, we don't have a treadmill in here, but I sometimes will just walk up and down my steps. Again, just to stimulate some activity. Sometimes I sit too long at my desk during the day, so it's nice just to get up and up and move in. Um, another really big one that um, you might want to kind of think about if you have constipation, you know, fiber, again, is going to be really important for that as well as water. So fiber is going to be found in your whole grains, your produce, and your beans. So that can really help promote that regularity as well. Just a few more products to hone in on um, since we're talking about fiber. Um, these fly off the shelf. Um, these Thomas English muffins, and I really like these light um, ones because they actually add in fiber. Um, they actually have eight grams of fiber per muffin. So just to give you a kind of a, a background, men, we need 38 grams of fiber every day. Women, we're striving for 25. So you find eight in one of these, and this is great toasted in the morning, spread a little bit, little bit of peanut butter and have a banana. A really quick breakfast idea, it takes no time at all. Um, but again, you get a lot of different food groups, a balanced plate, and it kind of will help promote everything to keep moving right along. Pasta, um, again, pasta should not be feared. Uh, all my carb haters, um, I really do promote the whole grain. It's an easy, easy supper idea. Um, something simple too, to add a veggie alongside with it or a side salad. Again, it's just coming back to, you know, how much are we filling our plate up with? Does the grain or the spaghetti take up the entire plate or is it taking up a, a quadrant of it and then you're adding some sides along with it? So these are awesome. I did what, since we're talking about pasta, um, Barilla recently came out with, again, sorry, I'm making sure that the glare is not there. 
Um, this is a chickpea pasta. So yes, it is made from chick chickpea flour and that is it. Um, I always tell people it, it takes maybe just a little bit longer to cook down, um, but it's, you can't even taste that there, that it's chickpeas, great source of fiber, great source of protein, and just a different alternative to your pasta dishes as well. All right. Oh, here's my product. Another really easy idea or an easy side dish. Again, it doesn't take long to cook in the microwave or uh, you won't have to stay in your kitchen for very long are these um, Uncle Ben's. You just tear it halfway open, pop it in the microwave for 90 seconds. Um, this is the whole grain brand. And again, it's great with stir fries, a great side along, you know, a piece of chicken breast or um, a lean piece of red meat. Um, but this is a really easy add to any meal. And again, it takes no time at all right in the microwave. So there is that recommendation for women and men for fiber. Um, only 3% of the population actually consumes enough fiber every single day. So just like when you're looking at your sugar um, contents, maybe on the packages of foods or drinks that you're eating, maybe check out how much fiber is in those products too. You might be alarmed to see that some of them may contain, you know, less than one gram. Maybe you'd be shocked to see how much fiber is actually in something, but lots of really great benefits to, to, um, go with fiber and there on your screen you'll can you can see that the high fibrous foods are going to be found in your fruits your veggies your whole grains and your beans water um, sometimes the medications that we're taking with our with Parkinson's disease cause us to be dehydrated um, so if you don't carry a water bottle around with you or you're not really great with drinking water Maybe thinking about carrying a water bottle with you is going to be really important. Uh, a good rule of thumb when people ask, you know, how much water they should be drinking. If you just take your weight and divide it by two, that's how much in water, or that's how many um, ounces in water you should be drinking every single day. So for example, a 150 pound person should be drinking 75 ounces or roughly nine cups of water. So again, if you feel like your energy levels have tanked, um, maybe you get headaches, uh, you know, thinking of including more water is going to be really important too. I will say that again, the produce is going to be high in that water content. So some high water content produce, your fruits include your grapefruits, your berries, watermelon, obviously is going to be containing a lot of water and then your veggies such as celery, spinach, and even squash actually has a good source of water as well. So again, back to that very first slide, you know, there is no prescription or no um, particular diet to follow when we're thinking of Parkinson's disease. Um, I did look into some other diets just to kind of see, you know, what is, you know, some of these bad diets that are out there for different types of, um, of maybe concerns that people are looking at, whether it's weight loss or, um, you know, celiac disease, the gluten-free diet, you've got to follow for that. So they have been tested. Um, and currently there's no, like I said, recommendation for a specific diet, which I think is even better because it just really hones in on making sure that we're including all the food groups. We're not excluding anything. We're just keeping check of sugar um, and really boosting up that, that water content as well. Many people may have heard of this MIND diet. Um, and again, it just kind of comes back to this way of eating. Um, it's encouraging the, the seafood. It's encouraging your produce. Um, again, the, the whole grains are going to be really, really important as well. So if you've heard of the MIND diet, it's kind of what we just talked about with the my plate as well. So lots of good research when it comes to back up um, kind of those antioxidants and whole grains that we're finding in all our food groups. And lastly, I just want to kind of share with you, because this is probably one of the most common questions I get is, can you provide me a meal plan? And I will say that, you know, meal planning, it's kind of one of those things where it can be as easy or as difficult as you make it. It's just what works best for you may not work best for me and vice versa. So 
when it comes down to it, we have to plan our meals, um, you know, a lot. So three meals a day, that equals 21 meals every week. That's over a thousand meals every single year. So don't make it difficult on yourself. I always say carve out about 15 minutes a week, hone in maybe on, on supper time, select three to four different dinner ideas, use those as leftovers for lunch the next day, um, and really just plan for those leftovers. Um, if you find a recipe that's really easy, it tastes great for the whole family, um, save it, keep it, um, kind of come back to it when you are kind of in a recipe rut. But um, those are kind of some good takeaways there, browsing the ad, kind of shopping that sale, planning your meals around that, that can help, help you in your um, meal planning as well. So I hope that I didn't go over time. Um, I will be answering questions here in a little bit. So hopefully you have some for me. Um, I've been lucky enough to come back this year. I know it, not in person, but um, we'll make do with virtually as well. So I will see you in a little bit to answer any questions that you might have. Thanks so much for listening, guys. Hi, Paige. Thank you so much. Let me, whoops, let me unmute. Hi there. There we go. You know, when I started earlier today, I forgot to unmute myself also. So <laughs> these new virtual world we're living in. <laughs> I know, right? There's so many buttons and making sure that it all looks good. And yeah. Yes. Well, thank you so much. I know that nutrition and Parkinson's is such a popular subject and it's really hard to find somebody who um, knows as much as you do so we appreciate oh. having you so much well thank you no it's fun yes. and like i said a little different than i love having a crowd in front of me but i just had to pretend that someone was watching me while i did it yes yes yeah okay so we do have some questions that well they've been rolling in so there's lots of questions yep. for you so i'll just go ahead and get started um, let's see here. So what are some, we have this first question. What are some energy boosting foods? I really struggle with fatigue. Sure. Um, and hopefully, um, from the presentation, you kind of just gathered that I'm a big advocate on that whole food with the, the produce, both in the fruits and in the vegetables. So again, a lot of times, will look for a supplement that kind of helps with their fatigue uh, but I promise you that the whole food source whether it is you know fresh or going into that frozen department and getting them frozen and put them in a smoothie or topping them on oatmeal can really help drive your energy levels up just with the different vitamins minerals and then again that water content that you're seeing in those produce items are going to really help with fatigue Awesome. Okay. Thank you. So let's see here. How many grams of protein should a person say? That's a great question. Uh, <laughs> and it's kind of when it comes down to, I get asked that, how many calories should I have? So that yeah. for every single person. Um, so to tell someone, you know, over, you know, the computer here that you need X, Y, amount of protein, um, you got to really look at your body size, you know, if you're male or female, your exercise level or, um, you know, how much you exercise in a day. Um, so if you want, go ahead and email and I can send you an exact amount, but to, I just don't want to give a, a recommendation over the computer. But use that email address, pgreen at hivy.com, and I'd be happy to help. Perfect. Yes. And that email address is um, on your local chapter's website. So anyone can hop on there and send her any questions. Okay. Yes. Let's go on to the next one. My sense of smell and taste have diminished due to Parkinson's. How can I make food more appetizing? Yeah. Great question. I feel like that's a struggle for a lot of people. So um, yeah, meals aren't going to maybe even sound good or um, seem good. So I always suggest spicy foods, and maybe that was something that you didn't even enjoy prior to that loss of taste or smell, but maybe that's going to be enough to stimulate your taste buds a little bit more. Um, sometimes people would rather eat hot food than cold food, but vice versa as well. So kind of play with it in the kitchen and 
Um, like I said, maybe it's cayenne pepper or you, you're adding a little bit of mint or even um, lemon juice can just really awaken some of those taste buds up. Um, and then again, just kind of trial and error with hot versus cold food. Okay. So try things that you wouldn't have necessarily tried before. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Um, okay. Do you have any tips for weight management with Parkinson's if I'm losing weight without meaning to? Yep. Another mm -hmm. common, um, common symptom or common problem that people might experience. Mm -hmm. I always say, you know, don't think of meals as being so overwhelming. They can be mini meals. Um, and when I say meal, think two food groups. Uh, so a carbohydrate and a protein, or um, if you're taking a medication, maybe it's a, a, you know, some crackers and a piece of fruit. Um, and like every two to three hours and kind of having more mini meals more often. That way you're not, you know, overdoing it at one meal and then not really hungry the rest of the day. So smaller, more frequent meals um, kind of throughout. Okay. I feel like all of these are pretty um, wonderful dietary tips for um, Parkinson's and in general. So, yes. yeah, yeah, I love that. Okay. Um, are there any dietary or herbal supplements that are recommended for Parkinson's patients? Yeah. So like mentioned, I did this presentation a year ago or a year ago this past summer. And um, I just, you know, did a little bit more research before this one just to see if there was any other or new guidelines out there. Um, currently, there's nothing yet. There's some that are being tested right now, but nothing that's going to say, you know, it slows the progression. Um, you may have heard of coenzyme Q. That's an antioxidant that's been tested, but again, hasn't been shown any proven results. Um, creatine is another one that's look, being looked at and gives energy to our muscles and to our brain. Um, and then turmeric, which actually has been shown to help with anti-inflammatory. That's also been, it's not a bad thing to add in. It's just, it doesn't show any, um, uh, it doesn't slow it, but it's good for anti-inflammatory. So it's great for anyone. So it might not be a bad thing just to add into our dishes and a little goes a long way. I sometimes add it to a smoothie. I can't taste it. Um, but it's just in there. So that could be a way to use, use that spice. Awesome. Okay. This is great information. Okay. Um, let's see with protein using the same receptors as levodopa medication should snacks not include protein. Yeah. So I've, I've heard from different doctors and read different things. So definitely talk with them. Sometimes I've heard, you know, they'll say wait 30 minutes before mm -hmm. few minutes after um to have that protein so definitely chat it over with them but you might want to wait that way you're just making sure that you're getting that full medication absorbed in your small intestine okay um let's see here is there a difference between protein from meat and protein from plant when it comes to absorb absorption <laughs> between um like interference and the gut for a levodopa to get through blood brain barrier? Sure. Um, well, considering that it's gonna be a good source of protein, it, same concept there is just kind of maybe just waiting, um, whether it is that plant source or coming from me itself, um, waiting before or 60 minutes after a meal too to take that medication. So um, again, talk it over with your doctor, but. Um, Protein is protein, and so it's going to recognize it as the same in your body. Okay. All right. Um, let's see here. We have another question coming in. It says, you mentioned eating fish twice a week. Does that include shrimp, um, clam, or just things like tuna and salmon? And why should we eat it so often? Sure. So that's a really great question because I oftentimes get that as well. So it's those omega-3 fatty acids that we're really, really striving for. So those higher fatty types of fish, um, or excuse me, um, shrimp contains less omega-3s than salmon, for instance. Um, so I really recommend the, the fattier types of omega-3 types of fish. Um, it's still okay to enjoy, but just know that I'm really you know, pushing for those higher omega threes. Um, again, good for inflammation, good for our heart, good for our brain as well. So um, if you feel like you're not getting enough omega threes, that's when maybe a supplementation might be necessary. 
Okay. Good to know. Okay. Um, here's a question. I also have type two diabetes. Does this change how I should eat for my Parkinson's? That's a wonderful question. And honestly, I use that my plate that I did in my presentation for weight loss for diabetes. It all comes down to portion sizes and um, that that my plate's a really good reminder and a good tool to showcase, hey, I can have carbohydrates, but I need to have it in this quantity versus spaghetti taking up my entire plate including fruits, including vegetables, having lean sources of protein. So um, kind of that my plate that I that I talked about for Parkinson's is a great tool for diabetes as well. So I would use that kind of in injunction with the with the two. OK. All right. Perfect. Um, let's see here. I just don't like the taste of vegetables. I really never have. Do you have any tips on that? I mean, don't, I mean, I'm in the same boat as this person. <laughs> yes. If I had a nickel for every time I heard that. No, <laughs> I will say that, I mean, I know that, you know, with COVID, it's hard to, to go out to places right now, but I always tell people to experiment with vegetables when other people are making them because maybe eating a raw piece of broccoli or cauliflower isn't that great. Um, but roasting vegetables can really highlight different flavors. So again, those frozen doors and the grocery store have a lot of different products that you can steam and roast vegetables that change the, the flavor. Um, and again, there's so much you can do with herbs and spices that, you know, a little bit of garlic, salt and pepper can go a long way. Um, again, if, if you still are curious, I have hundreds of recipes that if you're like, I need vegetable ideas, send me an email. I'd be happy to help you. But I really am a big advocate that, you know, vegetables are really, really important for, for all diets, but especially Parkinson's just for, you know, again, our energy levels. We want to make sure that we're getting those antioxidants and those vitamins and minerals too. So I really, really hope that there's a dish you can find that you like and you can keep incorporating that into your diet. Okay, perfect. Well, actually playing off of that one, I tend to kind of play around and try to find different ways to sneak vegetables into my kids' diets. And yes. so like I've done like cauliflower rice and I've sauteed it up in a pan a little bit and added some um, seasonings and you can't tell the difference. We've done rice bowls. My kids know no difference. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Spinach, I mean, I do this a lot with, I used to do kids cooking classes all the time. Spinach is an easy one, easy thing to throw into smoothies, scramble in eggs. It's there, but they're not going to know, or you won't know that it's there. So um, yeah. hiding them is just fine. Just consume it. Yes. <laughs> okay. Let's see here. We have, my symptoms make it hard to cook. I am not comfortable using knives and sometimes the stoves or the stove. What can I do? Yeah. Um, hopefully you kind of took note of some of those microwavable options that I showed you, um, those Uncle Ben um, packages where you just tear and you place in the microwave for 90 seconds. Um, then you've got warm rice that you can add. Um, take advantage of the canned, um, whether it's tuna, the rotisserie chicken that you can find already shredded for you. Um, that can be really helpful. Peanut butter is a really good source of, you know, that healthy fat and protein. So, you know, pairing that and mixing in with your oatmeal. Again, another easy microwavable breakfast that you can do. Um, toaster ovens, you know, toasting a couple slices of bread. So I totally understand the, you know, the stove and not kind of wanting to deal with all that. But kind of think about how you can use your microwave or some of those kind of already prepared items at grocery stores and kind of make a meal um, balanced at home yourself. Okay. All right. Perfect. Um, yeah. Let's see. You suggested a lot of packaged food options, which I suspect are processed. Isn't it better to have fresh veggies or does that matter as much? Um, well, and hopefully you'll notice that like the single vegetables, I mean, yes, you can get the ones that have the sauces and the seasonings, but a lot of them is just the frozen cauliflower and broccoli that they just blast in the fruit in the freezer bag. Um, so just as nutritious, so you can pop that into the microwave and steam them again, the rice, just the rice, um, that chickpea pasta I showed just contain the chickpea flour. So yes, a lot of the products maybe were packaged. Um, 
But then I, you know, and I could show you a whole other slew of products where, you know, you've really got to put recipes together, but people aren't spending a lot of time in the kitchen anymore. So it's really just finding maybe a packaged item with minimal ingredients. So for instance, the oatmeal too, it had four ingredients in that entire box of oatmeal, but it was a very easy thing to whip together. So there are items that you can find that are going to be more whole. Okay. Good to know. Okay. Um, we have a tip here real quick. I never really liked water, but I love lime and seltzer water. And now I drink it all day. It's a great tip that worked for them. Awesome. Thank you for sharing. That's great. Yeah. Okay. Let's see here. Oh, I feel like a lot of people are probably wondering this question, any healthy Mac and cheese recipes. And they put hashtag asking for a friend. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, this is funny that you say that. So what we've recently discovered that, or kind of what we've been doing is taking a hammer helper box and dumping out the noodles, but replacing it with whole grain noodles. So, uh, or I've done chickpea noodles too, because I love the, I just love the differences, um, just different type of nutrition coming from different type of noodles. So uh, whether it's, you know, kind of just creating your own mac and cheese by using whole grain noodles, adding um, a little bit of milk and then real cheese versus the Velveeta stuff that can make it significantly healthier. Okay. Good to know. Okay. Um, it's just me and my husband in the house and neither of us eat much. It's hard to find recipes for just two people. Any good sources to find recipes? Reach out to me. I've got tons. So send me an email. I'd be happy to share. Um, another good source to um, a Google search with chicken recipes that serve two. I mean, you can make it as specific as possible and hundreds will come up. I don't know if you get on Pinterest. I'm a picture person. Um, so I, same thing, I'll type in my exact, what I'm kind of craving and I'll say, you know, a chicken recipe for two and pictures will pop up and I'm like, oh gosh, that looks good. And then you can click on that link. So that's another way, but reach out if you, if you want some tried and true recipes that I, I have done. Perfect. Okay. Are there any certain fruits or vegetables that are better to concentrate on than others? I just always talk about variety. Um, I feel like we go to the grocery store and we stay in that same rut. Maybe we're buying apples, bananas every single week. Um, so that's where the, the ad can really help you. Oh, grapes are on sale this week. I haven't had a grape in weeks. Let's do that. Um, so different produce is just going to give you different types of vitamins and uh, minerals. So you might as well just keep, keep switching them out. But no one food is going to be the the best. Um, I just think variety is going to be kind of your, your main goal there. Okay. So there's really no fruits or vegetables to steer clear from. No, no. Okay. Good to know. Okay. Well, that is, um, about all we have and we are so thankful you could join us today. I know that yes. this, your session was so sought after. So thank you so much. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Yes. Have a good day. Yes. You too. Bye-bye. Bye, -bye. Bye Paige. Hey, let's see here. So um, that was um, wonderful. So we just had a lot of great speakers. And um, in case you didn't catch me earlier when we first started, I'm Natasha Winterbottom and I'm with the Iowa chapter of the APDA. Um, we wanna thank each and every one of you for joining us today in our first ever Upper Midwest Parkinson Symposium, as well as, um, I mean, we're living through some odd times. So um, if we could just like, you know, all of us were taken out of our comfort zone with COVID. So I know everybody has worked tirelessly to figure out how this new virtual world works. And um, Rachel, Anishka, myself, um, which is the Minnesota chapter and the Wisconsin chapter and the Iowa chapter, we've really worked together pretty hard to figure out um, how to bring you great speakers to the comfort of your own home. And we hope you really enjoy everything today. Um, tomorrow we have some more wonderful speakers that will be joining us. So um, we're just really excited that you joined us. And I'm gonna turn it over to Rachel.
Thanks, Natasha. I thought the presentations today were great. And even though I've been working with Parkinson's disease day in and day out for years now, I know I learned some new things. So we hope that you all learned a lot of new things today too. Uh, we really did try hard to bring you some of the best speakers in the upper Midwest uh, that we could find. So thank you again for joining us today. Um, as Natasha said, my name is Rachel Wilberding. I'm with the American Parkinson's Disease Association's Wisconsin chapter. Um, so shout out to my Wisconsin folks that joined us today. Uh, thanks for being here. I also want to make sure that we take another moment to thank our sponsors today who made today's event spot today's event possible, uh, particularly our presenting sponsor for today, Acadia Pharmaceuticals. Uh, they've been wonderful in stepping up to help make this event happen today, uh, as well as our gold sponsors, AbbVie, Boston Scientific, Kiowa Kirin, and Neurocreen, as well as our silver sponsors, Accorda, Amneal, Lundbeck, and Medtronic. Uh, when the broadcast is over, you can feel free to scroll down and view their logos there, and you can click on any one of those logos to learn more about our sponsors. Uh, we really appreciate their support and uh, really hope that they have some great information to share with you as well. Uh, again, thank you all for being here today, and I want to turn it now over to Anushka in Minnesota. Thank you, Natasha and Rachel. I'm Anushka Scheel with the Minnesota chapter of the APDA. And after such a wonderful lineup of speakers today, I'm so excited to come back tomorrow and learn more. So don't forget, tomorrow you will log back in at the same time and in the same way that you did today to hear from three new speakers on some really exciting and informative topics. Mary Helen Conroy will speak on thriving with purpose in this wild world. Dr. Kristen Pickett will speak on meaningful physical activity for people living with Parkinson's disease. And the Iowa chapter medical director, Dr. Lynn Strzok, will be sharing a talk on the what and why of Parkinson's medication. And as always, we would love your feedback and ideas on new and evolving topics that you would like for us to bring to you at our next educational event. Thanks one more time from all of us here at APDA. We do look forward to seeing you tomorrow morning, bright and early at 9.30 a.m. Central. Uh, and don't forget to keep an eye on your local APDA chapter website for upcoming chapter events, updated information, uh, and different ways to get involved. While you're there, you can also make a donation if you choose to do so uh, to your local chapter. Those donations really do help us to continue offering the free programming that you have experienced today, as well as uh, support programming and exercise programming, educational programming throughout the year. We rely definitely on your uh, donations and really appreciate your support. And if you, were, if you missed part of today's broadcast, don't worry. Uh, it's been recorded and you'll be able to rewatch today's program right here and on the APDA YouTube channel as soon as we end today's broadcast. We'll also send out links to the individual presentations after the entire symposium is over so you can stay tuned and look for those uh, as well. So again, thank you for joining us for our first day of the Upper Midwest Parkinson's Symposium and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Bye-bye.